and we are live. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Good evening, everybody. This meeting of AJS Council is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video teleconference, and town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. I now call this meeting to order. Start with the land acknowledgement. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is situated within the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas, more specifically, the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, signatories of the Gunshot Treaty of 1788 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. This land is and will continue to be home to the Indigenous peoples. Let us acknowledge the mistakes and traumas of the past through authenticity and support truth and reconciliation. Let us engage and celebrate Indigenous communities by being leaders of action and acknowledging the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations towards truth and reconciliation. Let us keep these principles close as we continue towards truth and reconciliation and as we move forward with kindness and respect as a community. Does any member of council have any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Nope, seeing, hearing none. Um, moving on to the minutes, we have moved by Councilor Bauer, second by Councilor Crawford. Let me just pull up the proper thing here so I get it right. That the following minutes of previous council meetings be adopted. That's the minutes of the regular meeting of December 12th, 2022, the special meeting of January 5th, 2023, the closed meeting of January 5th, 2023, the special meeting of January 10th, 2023, and the closed meeting of January 10th, 2023. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Nope. Those in favor of approval? Thank you. That is carried. Um, members of the public, I'm going to modify the agenda slightly tonight um, out of respect of time. We're going to do the delegations first, which shouldn't take too long, um, items 5, 1, 5, 2, and 5, 3, and move question period to immediately after. And that way we can, we have a number of people wanting to speak to that item, and we'll be able to bring that motion forward at the time. So we'll move ahead to item 5.1. Just let me pull this up here on my screen. Uh, Durham Region Hospice Awareness Day, Eva Retty, Chair, Durham Region Hospice Whitby, and Chair, Victoria Order of Nurses, Durham Hospice Services. Uh, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Are you doing a delegation? Yeah, I'm just going to say a few words, if that's okay. okay please, please go okay, ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor Collier and members of Ajax Council. First, I would like to thank you for once again approving the proclamation for Durham Region Hospice Awareness Day on January 29. For the second year now, we will also be raising the flag at regional headquarters this Friday, the 27th at 10 a.m. I also want to thank you for your generous donation from the Mayor's Gala. This public support will assist with our ongoing education throughout Durham Region about what a hospice residence is and why it is so necessary for our community to have. I'm just going to give a quick overview about our project. The future 10 bed hospice residence in Whitby is one of three locations approved by the Ministry of Health in August 2017. Another hospice residence will be built in Clarington and the hospice in Port Perry opened its doors in the summer of 2021. Since that time, it has served the community well, although many more beds are needed in Durham region, especially in the Southern part. Since mid 2018, with the support of the community, we were able to raise the necessary funds to build the Whitby Hospice Residence, approximately $7 million, including the provincial allocation of $200,000 per bed. When that goal was reached in October 2021, we went to tender. The result of the tender process in January 2022 was that the project came in approximately $3.5 million more than originally estimated. This, of course, is reflective of the current construction situation since the pandemic. The board decided to postpone construction and to continue fundraising. Since the spring of 2022, the Whitby project has raised approximately 700,000 new dollars. We have also been researching some of the newer hospices to find out if there are any design changes we can make that will result in cost savings and better efficiencies. I'm happy to report they were currently working with our architects to enhance the current design of the Whitby Hospice residence to ensure the hospice reflects lessons learned during COVID and also to see where we can reduce costs if at all possible. To us, there is a silver lining to the unexpected delay caused by the increased 
construction costs. We are now adding private patios to each resident room. That will allow the resident and their bed to easily move outside any time of the day or night. We heard from other hospice staff that the patios were lifesavers during the pandemic when only one visitor was allowed inside. We heard of a young family who were able to camp outside their mother's room on the patio when the restrictions were tight. We also heard that many people who wanted to go to a hospice residence did not go because their family could not be with them. We have a chance to ensure that this doesn't have to happen at our hospice and that is why we are adding the patios. The Whitby Hospice residence will be built on land already donated by the town of Whitby and will overlook a wonderful green space and recreational park area. The hospice will consist of 10 private resident rooms with washrooms, a great room, kitchen, dining room, children's playroom, spa room, spiritual space, and will be staffed by a multidisciplinary team of healthcare healthcare professionals and highly trained volunteers. All services and meals for the resident are free. Parking is free for visitors and access to the hospice is available 24 seven. And the family dog is welcome to come and sleep on the bed. Many Durham region residents do not know what a hospice residence is and how beneficial it is to family and friends who are experiencing an end of life journey with a loved one. I know for a fact that when we open the doors and people see how beautiful a place hospice is, everyone will ask why we didn't have one sooner. So on behalf of our hardworking and dedicated team, I want to thank you for your support and for helping us to spread the word. Thank you, Eva. Uh, before I go to questions, I wanna thank you on behalf of myself and council for all the work you do in our community, all the residents you support across Durham and, and those in Ajax as well. I have the proclamation here that I'll read quickly. The Corporation of the Town of Ajax hereby proclaims January 29th, 2023 as Durham Hospice Awareness Day presented on behalf of myself and Ajax Council, January 23rd, 2023. And you'll get a hard copy of that um, from the clerk yes. as well. Thank I you. think we had a couple of questions. I saw Councillor Tyler Moran. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, yeah. um, Ms. Reddy, so much, as the mayor just said. Uh, for all the work you do, it's such so important when it's actually happening. Um, can you confirm the location in Whitby? Are you able to do that? Did you? Did I miss oh, that? Oh yes, it's no, no. I, I didn't say it. Actually, if you just go north on Highway Two, uh, off Highway Two on Kathleen, it's in Whitby. Sorry, um, near the intersection of Dixon and Highway Two. So if you go north on Kathleen, uh, there's a large green space. So it's basically at um, Prince of Wales Drive and uh, Crawford. Mm -hmm. Okay, got and, it. And um, so there was park. At, yeah. Well, good. The great, great work. Just, I was just curious because if it comes up, people say, "Where is it?" Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Collier. Yeah, and, uh, thank you, Miss Reddy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Does any other member of council have any questions for the delegation? Being none. Again, thank you every, for everything that you do. Glad we were able to support okay. you through the gala as well. And um, I look forward to your to your groundbreaking and um, seeing this come yes. to fruition. Thank you. Moving on to our next, we have recognition of the mixed ability Oshawa Vikings. And before I uh, go to them, they are that we have about four or five people here. I just have a quick opening I'd like to read to introduce them. So please bear with me for just a minute. Um, we've invited the mixed ability Oshawa Vikings to join us in celebration of their success at the International Mixed Ability Rugby Tournament in Cork, Ireland this past June of 2022. They're the first ever Canadian team to attend the event and place second out of 24 other countries. For those who aren't familiar with the mixed ability sport, it's a model of sport inclusion where players with and without disabilities play on the same team and are treated as equals. Team co-captain Elliot Smith is a 23-year-old Ajax resident. Elliot has autism and ADHD and is a huge advocate for sport. He's a Grandview Kids graduate sitting on their youth advisory committee and also works at the Ability Center as a physical fitness and literacy associate and mixed ability sports facilitator. Elliot was kind enough to share with me a copy of the book he wrote with his mom, Debbie, called Mateo's Mixed Ability Match. And all proceeds help give adults with disabilities an opportunity to try mixed ability sports like curling, archery, skating, and swimming. Joining us are Elliot Smith, his mixed ability Oshawa Vikings co-captain Malcolm Hooper and coach John Watkins, along with Kelly Casper, director of sport 
and Recreation at the Ability Center, and Mark Wafer, the Interim CEO of the Ability Center. With the Durham 2023 Ontario Parasport Games right around the corner, this is a timely celebration of inclusion in sport. And on behalf of Ajax Council, and Mr. Clerk, could you, oh, let me find my screen. Do you have the certificate that you could put on the screen, please, Mr. Clerk? There we go. Let me go back to my spot here. On behalf of Ajax Council, I'd like to present you with the following certificate, Mixed Ability Oshawa Vikings. The Corporation of Town of Ajax extends congratulations on achieving second place at the Mixed Ability Rugby World Cup, Cork, Ireland, in June 2022. As Mayor of the Town of Ajax, and on behalf of all members of Council, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate you on being an active and engaged member of the community. I think that... <laughs> Well done. Uh, I know you have a number of people here, uh, Elliot. I'm wondering if somebody would like to speak on behalf of the organization. Uh, go ahead, whoever, go ahead. I can't see everybody on the screen. I can start. Um, hi, John Watkins. I'm uh, the there president of the Vikings Rugby Club and also coach of the, the mixed ability rugby team that went to Cork Island. Uh, thank you very much for um, recognizing um, our achievements here at Council this evening. Um, we'll just tell a little bit about our program, um, and then I'll turn it over to our captains to kind of finish this off. Um, so our, our program um, is, a, is a new program uh, to, to the club. It was established in 2019 um, in partnership with uh, the Ability Centre, Rugby Ontario, and Mixed Ability Sport Canada. Um, we started our a flag program um, in... Um, over COVID um, for two years, um, and just a, a flag program, which kind of introduced the sport of rugby to, to, um, to, to players. Um, and from there, um, we were accredited the, the first club in Canada um, through Mixability Sport Canada for, um, for Mixability Sport. Um, from there, we were invited to participate in IMART um, um, to represent Canada with 24 other teams. Um, and we we just started kind of training in January of 2022, and 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 kind of worked really hard to prepare for the event uh, for 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 June. So just just in five months, we we transitioned from flag rugby to contact rugby, um, and went to IMART, um, uh, competing against 24 other teams, not really knowing what to expect uh, when we went into the tournament, but uh, um, we. We ended up playing teams from Spain, England, Ireland, and Argentina uh, through the tournament and uh, made the finals where we, we played the host, host club uh, from, uh, from Cork, Ireland in the final in front of 4,000 people. So um, the, the club was really represent, represented well at IMART and um, the, the players worked really hard um, to, to achieve this goal. So that's a little bit of an overview of our program. I'll turn it over to Elliot just uh, and Malcolm to say a few words if they'd like. Well, uh, I would like to say uh, that's really good that we did a lot at the uh, IMER tournament. And basically what mixed ability is, is that Mixed ability is where athletes with and without disabilities play on the same, same uh, team together where everybody's included and where everybody's treated the same. And uh, IMART is where 24 other countries uh, compete in the men's and women's rugby tournament. And the Canada men's rugby team came in second out of the 24 other countries from all around the world. And the women's rugby team came in third for Team Canada at the IMART tournament in third place to, to get the bronze medal. And uh, I uh, scored the game winning try in one of the games against the West Court Jesters. And then uh, I got to score the game winning try at the end of the game. And then I got to shoot the boot with Coke where all my rugby teammates were chanting, ooh, ah, shoot the boot, ooh, ah, shoot the boot. And then it was like some magical fun experience because I got to shoot the boot from a game used dirty rugby boot. And once again, that's Max Barrel's game used dirty rugby boot. And I shot the boot with, with Coke, and Coke went all over my shirt, which was one of Aaron Ramlichen's birthday shirts, which was so hilarious. Very good. Very good. Well, I'm not sure if uh, members of council have any questions for you, Elliot. 
Councillor Crawford. I just have a question around the whole concept of mixed ability. How is that mixed? What is that mix? Um, so I can answer that question for you. Um, my name is Malcolm Hooper. Um, so I'm, I was one of the co-captains with Elliot for uh, the trip to IMART. And uh, as it's been said, it was a new concept as of three years ago in Canada. And uh, rugby was the first program that we started to run. But mixed ability is essentially what the name entails. It's mixed. So it's mix of age. It's mix of uh, experience. It's mix of disabilities. It's mix of abilities. It's, it's mixed all around. Um, yeah, and it's just the biggest thing about mixed ability sport is that we're not changing the game. It's just tradition, traditional game, uh, just played with mixed ability on the field. If that helps shed some light. Yes, I think that's fantastic. Thank you. I think I think there's many many of us that could learn from mixed ability, and I think that's great that the inclusion piece of it is there. So thank you and bravo for doing that, uh, doing that. And Elliot, my goodness, what it sounds like you had a blast. And congratulations on all of that success. I'm, we're very proud of you. So once there again, here's my award from uh, the town of Ajax and uh, Mayor Sean Collier saying like, thanks for all the job well done. And it's basically like a key to the city from Ajax all the way from the Oshawa Viking <laughs> Turkey Football Club. And it's like, we're all having a good time. We're training for the next tournament, which is either going to be in Argentina or Italy or the Netherlands. Awesome. I'm a little jealous of your travel schedule. But congratulations again <laughs> from, from all of us and continue the great work. And I'm sure we'll cross paths again soon. Thanks, Elliot. Okay. And T. Thanks, Mr. Mayor Collier. And uh, you yeah, have a great night. You too. So moving on, we're going to go to question period now. Mr. Clerk? Who do we have for um, questions on tonight's agenda? Mr. Mayor, we have Amanda Downs, Eric Novak, Chris Wheeler, and Dane Record here to pose questions uh, about tonight's agenda. Okay, I guess I'll go in that order. Uh, Ms. Downs, are you ready? Good evening. Um, Thank you for allowing me to uh, attend this evening. Um, I wanted to speak to the NZO motion being put forward today. I've lived in Ajax for over 20 years and I've watched it slowly become paved with sprawling subdivisions. And I've experienced the increasing traffic delays trying to get to and from work. However, I've not come here today to complain about developers, but to actually support our council's plans to hasten the building of high density residences within employment areas. We need to create more homes, and more jobs in the town of Ajax, and we need to do it quickly because we have an acute housing shortage. If we build more commercial buildings, we create jobs, but then we also increase traffic congestion if people cannot live near their workplace. If we build detached homes, like we have been doing for the last few decades, um, but we don't create places of employment, then again, we're just going to increase that traffic congestion. It therefore makes sense to build upwards and to integrate commercial employment units into those new residential towers. Now, I know there are people living in the town of Ajax who will object to the development of residential towers simply because they don't like towers. And maybe they're also the same people who don't approve of commercial development in the town either. I'm certain they're the same people who complain about our high council tax charges, even though more high density residential dwellings and more commercial properties would increase the tax base and likely lower our council tax rates. So the subject lands we're considering today have already been zoned for development. This is not under debate. They're zoned as prestige employment areas, a year ago, Ajax Council supported the conversion request submitted by landowners to rezone them as residential to allow the building of high density mixed use properties, which can only be built on residential zoned land. These requests were endorsed by Durham Region Council. And without an NZO, the rezoning process will take nearly two years. It's going to needlessly waste taxpayers' money because the land would eventually be rezoned to residential anyway. 
So instead of stringing out the process, it makes sense to apply for an MZO and do it now. We urgently need the new homes, um, new homes that are also close to where people work. MZOs have taken on a sleazy image thanks to some municipalities using them to bypass important planning processes and putting our environment at risk. However, we need to remember that the original purpose of MZOs was to cut bureaucracy and speed up the planning process, not to eliminate it altogether. But when the conclusion is already inevitable, it makes no sense to prolong the process at the expense of taxpayers. The town of Ajax has already shown that it can use the MZO process correctly, for example, for hastening the build for long-term care facility in the north of the town. Without an MZO, the rezoning process will take me two years of unnecessary bureaucracy. So I support the council requesting an MZO so that we can proceed with building new homes and new employment opportunities now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, did you have any specific questions on the motion? Um, I think the I question I want to pose is um, what safeguards are in place to make sure that what is being proposed to be built on these lands will actually be built? Um, I can take a stab at it and then I'll ask our director of planning, Mr. Romanowski, to come on and correct me if I go wrong. But my understanding, and there's two, there's one, if we allow the municipal comprehensive review process to go ahead and the lands are converted, and if that happens, they're converted to residential, and through zoning bylaws, I believe we can set some conditions as to what can be put on those lands, but I'm not sure how enforceable it is. Through the minister's zoning orders that the motion that's on the agenda today, um, we are able to put specific or request the minister put specific requ um, requirements in there as to density, as the number of residential units. We can't specify that these be affordable, but we can request that they be affordable. Those decisions are made through the site plan process with uh, federal and provincial tax dollars. Um, so Mr. Romanowski, is that is that accurate? Uh, through the chair to the mayor. Yeah, I believe you've covered it. Uh, Stev Andis is also on our online. She's our manager of planning. She's more intimate with the ins and outs of this type of tool. Uh, Stev, is there anything that you want to add to what the mayor has uh, put out there? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yes, through the chair. Um, an additional checkpoint uh, in terms of having a development go through an MZO process is that they would still have to go through a site plan application process. And then through that, we would be requesting studies and reports to ensure land use compatibility. So there would be reports such as an archeological assessment, records of site condition to ensure environmental um, hazards are mitigated, um, transportation impact studies and so forth. Okay, thanks, Seb. Does that answer your question, Ms. Downs? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Does any member of council have any questions uh, to Ms. Downs on her delegation? No. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, moving you. on to our to moving on to our next speaker um, with questions is we have um, Ajax resident Eric Novak. Hello, uh, I am here. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Collier, and uh, good evening to you as well and members of Ajax Council. Um, as we're hearing here, to MZO or not to MZO, that uh, apparently is a question <laughs> that Council is being asked to consider. Now, I've asked for this opportunity to address you this evening after reviewing the agenda for the meeting. And of course, we're talking about item 9-1, which is the motion being brought forward by Mayor Collier and seconded by Councillor, Regional Councillor Coffer, the accelerating development of thousands of new housing units. Um, as you're aware, the motion, of course, if passed, would have council request that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing enact an MZO on five employment area conversion requests that this council has already approved. Uh, my understanding of the request after reading and interpreting the motion is to expedite the conversion of employment lands to allow for new proposed mixed high density residential and commercial developments. 
An MZO, as I understand it, would circumvent the often long and arduous process of reviewing and considering rezoning requests. It overrides many of the traditional processes that are in place that are meant to ensure any challenges fall in line with the official plan guidelines and other factors. Now, Mayor Collier, members of council, I don't need to tell you that within the public discourse, the term MZO carries a lot of charged opinions. Most of it, of course, stems from the inappropriate attempts by the city of Pickering to rezone environmentally sensitive lands near the Durham Live project to allow for a logistics warehouse. I myself was a vocal opponent of that attempt and I was relieved that the public pressure to halt the MZO was successful. Now, in this particular instance, however, it is my view coming that from the perspective of a 21 year resident of Ajax, a professor of sustainable urban development at Seneca College, a journalist, and as a general advocate of sustainable planning and development principles in general, the council should approve this motion and make the request. The well-documented housing crisis in this province needs to be solved, but the best solution, of course, is to find opportunities to redesign and rethink how low-density communities like ours work. Instead of egregious attempts to tear up greenbelt lands for low-density, unserviced, and inappropriate housing, the province should prioritize any opportunities such as these to build up, actually to build up where possible and not to build out. Now, many of the world's leading sustainable urban planners, such as Canadian Brent Totteron, recognize that we can no longer accept low-density suburban living as a normal element of growth. Higher density, mixed-use development minimizes the need for cars as a main way of getting around. Higher density living makes mass transit more feasible, and it creates opportunities for pedestrian and cycle-friendly living that is better for society and environment, plus it more quickly meets a housing inventory crisis that must be dealt with effectively and efficiently. You know, every time I visit someplace like the Durham Center, I'm reminded of how wrong we have planned our land use up until now. How we accept that massive, low-density commercial centers that are grotesque in their land use and utilization, it needs to change. And this type of change starts by recognizing, accepting, and fighting for responsible zoning amendments that embrace responsible mixed-use utilization wherever and whenever possible. So in closing, I urge you to approve this motion and in so doing to also be effective and especially to be effective in communicating with the citizens of Ajax as to why requesting an MZO in these instances is not the same as the Pickering examples, but rather a case of where Ajax is being responsible and sustainable with their attempts to provide additional housing and vibrant commercial developments at the same time. I mean, given that these conversions have already been approved plus the urgency to increase housing inventory in Ontario, if there is a way to expedite the process and an MZO request is such a way, voting to approve the motion is to my mind, the right thing to do in this instance. And I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak. And I'm certainly happy to uh, talk to the member or answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Did you have any specific questions to the motion? Um, I, one uh, one and one a question, of course, would be uh, if, in fact, the MZO request is made and granted, um, how much time should we reasonably expect to uh, see saved in the overall process? And if I guess there are any sort of hesitancies, is it more than just the perception of it? I mean, what would what would cause someone on council to vote no? Uh, I'll take once again. I'll take a crack at it, and then I'll I'll. Uh, open it up to to staff to to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there's a couple of a couple of pieces to this. I mean, if the right now with Bill 23, we're not absolutely certain that the current municipal comprehensive review process is going to be allowed to run to completion. Mm. If it's not, because the region of Durham, I think, is the last region to submit their municipal comprehensive review. It's not done yet. I think I think York, Peel, Halt, and the others were all done last year. If that process is disrupted and not allowed to complete, then, then these, these conversion requests wouldn't happen anyway. Um, if we this MZO motion passes today and once it comes forward, again, we're making the very big assumption that the province will listen to us and grant the request and issue the MZOs. That is completely at the Minister of Municipal Fair and Housing's discretion. That could take two weeks. That could take six months. We don't know. The other two that we did took, uh, I think, in the neighborhood of, of three to four months, I believe. And uh, there is going to be some time in between if the motion passes today and the request, because one of the things in speaking with Municipal Affairs and Housing 
is they want us to specify what we want in the MZO. They want us to sort of give them the conditions that we want in there. And one of the conditions that we want to be able to, I mean, I don't know how we can hold them to it, but I want to put is one that it has to be specific density, specific commercial densities, specific residential, specific um, number of story heights contain um, affordable type housing units and um, that be a site plan be submitted within one year. Uh, also that that we would request that we would have the opportunity to request the minister to revoke the MZO if these conditions are not met. Right. As to your question on the time saved potentially, if the MCR process is allowed to run through to completion, I think that the region should be wrapping it up and submitting it to the province before the summer break, sometime around April, May, I believe. And then again, depends on how long the province will take to approve it. And assuming they approve it and they expedite it, then it comes back to the region and to the town to update the region official plan, the town official plan, and our zoning bylaws, which could take an ad additional year. So that to me is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 18 months. How did I do, Jeff? Uh, to the through the chair to Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think you pretty much covered it. Uh, I think the numbers, the the, the timelines are are pretty fair, uh, plus or minus. Uh, Sean McCullough, our supervisor of planning policy and research, is also on the line and familiar with some of the other. MZOs that we've processed or been involved with with the province with regards to Schlegel and the LTC, and I think those timelines that you 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 mentioned the three to four months made sense. Um, definitely, a lot of time will go into how much that is if the if the motions passed and working with the province to craft the MZO and get the right performance standards etc. in there. That would be part of the. The discussion and the timing as well. Sean uh, McCullough, my Sean, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to add there that that the mayor uh, raised? Uh, no, through the mayor to the delegate, and uh, I, I think that covers everything uh, for the most part. I think um, those timelines are reasonable. Um, again, there's a big. We we don't know how long the province would take to approve the region's official plan. They have 120 days themselves, but. Um, of course, we've seen regional official plan amendments take up upwards of over a year uh, for approval. So some things could take longer, um, but I think the the timeline that the mayor outlined um, makes sense. Okay, I, I did see a couple of questions from council. I have Councillor Henry followed by Councillor Lee. Councillor Henry. Hi, uh, through the chair to Mr. Novak. I just wanted to verify um, you're aware that um, four of the MZOs were in Ward 2? Uh, Mr. I, Novak? I mean, I, yeah, I, I can hear you, Councillor Henry. Um, I, uh, I, I have looked at the, what I saw based on the agenda, so I, I have a rough idea of where they are. I don't, I don't specifically remember the ward boundaries each time I look at it, but I know roughly where they're approximated, yeah. Okay. And sorry, just to confirm, you live in which ward? I live in, uh, I'm in South Ward 3. Okay, is that, thank is you. That, is my, that relevant? That's, that's my question. Is, I'm is just, it, I'm just, I'm just wondering um, the delegates that are here today, how many are in Ward 2 in, in where the, the majority of the MZO requests are. I'm just curious. I, thank I speak, you for that. I, I speak as a resident of the town of Ajax. I don't, I don't view my interest with Ward boundaries. I see it as the needs of the town. Further, and I, and I recognize that I, I recognize that, but I, I have a responsibility to the voters of Ward Two. That's why I'm asking. So thank you for that. Much appreciated, Councillor Lee. Um, <clears throat> yes, we absolutely trust uh, your input, even though you're a Ward Three resident, uh, Mr. Novak. But um, you, you, asked, you, po you posited thank the you. question of um, where, where's the concern? Where's the um, where, why would some councillors oppose this? Yes, and um. You know, I'll go over this at the motion part, but just um, the, the key piece right now is that an MZO cannot be rescinded by council. So in other words, we could change the zoning to residential, and then I'm at the mercy of the developers to honor what they say they're going to do and not sell their properties. And then you're now zoned for residentials, townhouses. 
Uh, number two, I'm now at the mercy of the province uh, to listen to us. If we say, hey, these developers aren't playing ball now. Uh, we want to rescind it. Uh, only they, only this ministry has the ability to rescind an MZO. We can request it all we want. They don't have to listen to us, uh, nor have they ever listened to us as evidenced by the um, the Greenbelt lands that they've appropriated uh, for sale for development. So it's like, I have a, I have a big concern with the, uh, this ministry in general and their ability to fulfill their promises, especially with this municipality. So that is where the crux of my concern comes from. And Thank you for answering that, Councillor Lee. And I, and I would wonder if under the circumstances, given the priority that the province has put on expediting the amount of housing that is necessary, and if I may just put on my, my media journalist PR hat, the amount of bad coverage that they have been given, um, one would think if there's an opportunity to shine a little bit of good light saying, no, we understand we're actually doing something and you know, let it not be forgotten that their own housing assessment uh, task force declared that there is already enough land to, to, to use to brownfield to go up and not out. I mean, if a request came like this with specific requests and instructions, why would it not be um, why would it not be permitted or not be carried out? And is there any is there any precedence of a developer uh, receiving such requests and then going back on their word? No, but there's precedence of uh, developers getting, you know, uh, bylaw or, you know, zoning, not through an MZO, but through uh, Taunton and Audley is a very good example. And I, 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 don't, I don't think they're building. They, they got their, they even got site plans to us, which went to council and painted the whole stack towns. And then yeah. it's just empty because I think they're going to sell that land. So it's I, just I like, would just, yeah. no, sorry, forgive me, forgive me. I would just think that given the public attention to MZOs uh, that we've had, given the uh, increased attention to the need for housing and given the, you know, the very poor choices they've made up till now, I, you know, I, I your points are all well taken, but I think, you know, uh, optics do stand for something. And I, I, you know, if this was granted, I mean, you know, guarantees are guarantees, but I, I just, I would think this might have a little bit of a different urgency to to carry the letter of their quest out than to risk um, changing their mind and, you know, feeling the wrath of citizens alike if they did. I mean, so I we're, we're we're getting very close to debating here. Sure. Uh, my, thank questions. you, my fault. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, was there anything further, Council Lee? No, again, uh, you asked the question, and that's where my concern comes from. So thank oh, you. Thank, very thank you. Thank you for answering that. Mr. Novak, thank you so much for coming today and expressing your, your uh, support. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, uh, members of council. I appreciated the opportunity. Next, I believe we have uh, Chris Wheeler. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor Collier and uh, and council for giving me a few minutes tonight to express my feelings on, on the motion uh, accelerating development of thousands of new housing units. And uh, before I begin, I think it's obvious I'm a member, or I'm a, a citizen of Ajax. I'm also a citizen of Ward 1, uh, but my doctor is in Ward 2. My shopping is in Ward 2. I drive through Ward 2 to get to work. Uh, what else is in Ward 2? The place where my kids went to school. I mean, all kinds of stuff in, in Ward 2 that Ward 1 and Ward 3 residents use. So I think the concerns and the supports that we are are all offering here are relevant regardless of which ward we live in. Now, I support this motion. Ajax has sprawled to its capacity and has very little room to grow outwards. At the same time, we have a housing crisis with affordable homes in short supply. Over the past five years, Ajax Council has stood as a voice, often a lone voice, I'll point out, against the destructive environmental practices that our neighbors to the north and west have employed to build sprawling single dwelling neighborhoods. I think it's fair, as others have already acknowledged, uh, to continue to acknowledge that ministerial zoning orders are spotlighted as the tool that facilitated and continue to facilitate across the province, the reductions in green spaces and watersheds in favor of sprawling car-centric housing. At the same time, MZOs are a tool that, when used properly, can help house people and grow a community in an environmentally sustainable and an economically viable way. The five proposed sites in tonight's motion were supported by Ajax Council almost two years ago and approved by Regional Council. Using zoning orders to accelerate development on a decision already made, to my mind, is prudent. Now, I've visited each site listed in the motion. Four of the five sites, even though I am in 
Ward 1 are a 15-minute walk uh, from my house. Two of the sites, uh, CNR 07 and CNR 19, are marked for high-rise development. Neither site is adjacent to existing residential. Uh, both are within walking distance of grocery, retail, restaurants, and medical offices. Uh, CNR 19, the site near Salem and Rossland, is within walking distance of two secondary and multiple elementary schools. And both sites can leverage existing services. This is the same for the other three sites with the added distinction that they integrate well into existing townhome developments in the area. To my, to my thinking, driving density will reshape the urban landscape of Ajax, attracting new commercial opportunities and driving growth for existing businesses. Over time, we'll see reduced transportation emissions as residents turn to walking, cycling, and transit for work and shopping. We will see more efficient use of developed land and the type of housing built, townhomes and apartment buildings, will be more energy efficient than single dwelling homes. So in short, I support focusing on density housing and using MZOs properly to accelerate the development of all previously approved sites. This is a well thought out plan that will see Ajax manage sustainable growth for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to questions, did you have any specific questions on the, the motion? Yes, I, I do have one specific question and it, it uh, it's related to increased traffic capacity. So we're already seeing on, on Harwood north of Rossland, a number of developments, Grandview facilities there, uh, the mosque has grown and, and there's already residential. And I'm wondering with the addition of the two new um, townhome uh, developments, if we're going to see a uh, increase in uh, capacity on, uh, on Harwood. Um, again, I'll, I'll take a shot at it, then, then be corrected by staff if necessary. We have accelerated the widening of Harwood Avenue north of Woodcock, I think it is, where that light is, just north of Notre Dame. I think it was originally in the in the capital forecast around 2027, and we have, uh, I think, doing design this year, construction next year, or maybe design is done, it's construction this year, I'm not sure, but we have accelerated it due exactly to what you pointed out, Mr. Wheeler, the Grandview, the new Grandview Children's Center, the Schlegel Village, um, 192-bed long-term care facility and associated retirement home next to it, the new townhouse development next to that, and as well as other development that could happen uh, further north. Just to add a little bit, part of the MCR process, we approved five of the 15 conversions based on some criteria that we had set at the town. The region of Durham went one step further and their staff suggested that everything north of Rosland and east of Harwood and west of Salem up to the tracks and then following the tracks be converted and all be allowed to be um, residential or mixed use. So again, I think all those things factored into our decisions to um, to accelerate the widening of Harwood. But uh, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Romanowski to clarify. Uh, yes, uh, to the mayor, to the delegate. Uh, yeah, we are going through the Harwood Avenue EA north of, Har no north of Woodcock up to Taunton for the twinning of Harwood, um, Grandview, Schlegel, other developments along there are all inputs in that criteria. I believe once we finish the EA, we move into the design work towards the end of this year in 23 into 24 mm -hmm. with construction towards the end of 24 into 25. Um, subject to council's budget approval, of course, as it's part of our, our considerations there. But uh, there is the need for that widening regardless of the developments within this corridor. And that's been part of the rationale for, for it is, is, is Grandview, is Schlegel, are these other developments in this part of town to ensure we're managing the traffic expectations um, in the north part of the town. Thank you. And just Mr. Romanowski to add, if this uh, motion passes tonight and we are issued these MZOs through site plan, they still would all have to do a transport study and everything else through the site plan process, regardless of the widening of our road. 100%. Uh, all, all site plans would require some type of traffic impact 
uh, study to assess the the in in egress egress from the site out to the controlled right of way and how it interacts with the other properties adjacent adjacent to them. Uh, did that answer your question, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay. Did I see any hands? A member of council wishing to ask a question through the delegate. No. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Appreciate your input. Thank you. Uh, the last uh, delegate we have in a question period, we have Mr. Dane Record. Is Mr. Record available? Mr. I'm here. I'm not allowed to turn on my video. Y'all got to let me turn my video on if you want to see. <laughs> it's not absolutely necessary, I don't think. If you're, if, you're more you if you're more comfortable with it. Oh, no, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, residents, and and staff, thanks for, for this opportunity. Um, just, I, just to note, I am bearing or paying attention, but I also have some loud mouths in here that I got to keep quiet for this. Um, here speaking with regard to, to this MZO and um, being a resident in, in a high rise, um, in a really, really active, really vibrant area uh, where we're seeing a number of um, multi-use and mixed-use buildings being being developed and built and still waiting on others to come. Um, I'm actually in support of this happening. Um, we've seen exponential growth in this town since uh, since our family arrived here in, in 95, uh, just from the town to the west and also the town to the east. Um, having family now in in a number of areas throughout Ajax, not all concentrated in one space, it just makes sense that we that we explore this option and actually do the work to to see it through. Um, what we see and what I'm seeing just from being in in the area and the community, um, you know, businesses are happening and and they're thriving. Folks are able to to be in their homes, stay in their homes, and and folks are really looking out for each other. Um, it's an experience that that as a as a renter and as as somebody living in 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 a high rise community um, for, for for folks who may be unfamiliar um, it is quite the family and familial experience that that um, i would like to see in in other areas in this town um, the concern that may come up um, and a question that that I've had for a number of years has already been answered um, with with great surprise and impression uh, with regard to um, transportation and, and just moving around town. Um, there's already a plan plan um, working along with Metro links um, to, to get some bus rapid transit out out here in Durham cutting through Ajax, that'll be interesting to see, but it is it is necessary. It is absolutely necessary for, for the growth and overall success of, of, the, of the town and, and the residents and communities going forward. Um, seeing the use of, of the MZO to um, make purpose of some areas that have just been been hanging around for a bit um, is better and in my opinion better for for everybody involved like we've seen we've seen for those who've been around for a while we saw how long it took for verona mall to come up um, people live on those lands now that took a heck of a lot of work and so um, not looking to repeat that um, having this tool at our at our availability, um, that tool being the MZO. If things can get done a heck of a lot quicker and we can get some, some housing 
and some businesses and some affordable um, units available. So the folks in town don't need to leave town because they can't afford to stay in the town. We can see some, some of these things and, and couple them with the, the already planned um, transit strategy uh, regionally and provincially, then this is a, is a no-brainer, easy win. And um, in terms of questions, um, one question that, that I do have is with regard to public consultation. Um, was, there, was there a uh, an opportunity or a number of opportunities for public consultations um, with with regard to the MZOs? Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. The, when AJAS Council met in February, 2021, it was an open public meeting when we made the, the initial decision. And that was not on MZOs, that was on the conversion requests. So requests from 15 developments asking to have their um, lands converted from commercial to residential and those those concepts came forward at my request okay they weren't magic they just we had these lands we identified these strategic type of places where they would fit we had them put together concept plans of what that would look like instead of just building single story warehousing or commercial that might you know employ a certain number of people having 25 stories of residential above and a portion being affordable was something that I felt was important and council felt was important and we supported those um, for those reasons. Um, at the region, there was more, so that is a public meeting. It wasn't actually public open as a consultation, that was a public meeting. The At the region, um, it was a public consultation process, I believe, because the, the Municipal Comprehensive Review goes out for public consultation on each part. So the regional approval of those requests were through the public process. And what we've already mentioned earlier is any, if this was approved, development application that comes forward through site plan is going to be required to go through all of the um, standard things with all the studies that are gonna be required with regards to, to traffic, with regards to all the other different things, as well as the full public process. Any further? Um, no, just uh, that was just my one question. Um, okay. Open to hearing, fielding. I see a hand. I see a hand too. Councillor Henry, you have a question. Hi. Uh, hi, Dane. Nice to see you. You look good. Hope the family's well. Um, my question to you is with regards to uh, your definition of affordable housing. Could you elaborate on that? Um, the Ontario living wage and, and looking at the um, cost of living, the overall cost of living. Um, in Durham Region, the information is available and accessible through the region website of the, the living wage. Um, if that can be factored into um, the cost of, of living in this in this town and and navigating the region, then that would be that would be wonderful. As opposed to just defaulting to a um, to a provincial archaic model. And would you would you agree? Like, are you referring to affordable housing or geared rent income housing? That's a great question, actually. Um, affordable affordable is one thing, but that's subject to the town. Um, rent geared to income would be fantastic um, if that if that could be a thing, if that could be realized and effectively um, util utilized. Um, there's a number of folks who. shouldn't have to move because they can't afford rent or or shouldn't have to to leave town and go further further east or or north because 
because it's a because because cost of living is what it is. Um, so um, glad to be in the town and, and of the town because um, I'm pretty confident that we can see um, greater conversations about affordable housing and rent geared to income. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Crawford. Anything further? Thank you, Mr. Record. Appreciate you coming and expressing your views tonight. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clerk, is there any other residents wish to speak under question period? No, there are not. Okay, thank you. Um, members of council, I am open. Would you prefer I, I can bring the motion forward and we can deal with it at this point, or we can move on to the final presentation, and deal with it through the agenda? Councilor Lee? Uh, let's just deal with it now. It's okay. The, the delegates might be waiting for the decision, so let's just deal with it now, in my opinion. Okay. I, I would agree. I just wanted to ask the question. So I'm going to move forward item 9.1, modify the agenda. And I'm going to turn the chair over to Regional Councilor Lee, as myself and Councilor Crawford are the movers and the seconders. Thank you, uh, Mayor Collier. Uh, as the mover of the motion, did you want to go ahead and I don't know, you want to read it all or what part? Do you well, want I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, maybe if the clerk can just put the therefores on the screen. I do have um, some comments I would like to make. Please. Thank you, Chair. And I understand I have five minutes. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we honoring that? <laughs> so I just to start, I, I was incredibly proud of this council in February 2021 when we made the bold move to support the creation of pedestrian friendly, live work, high density communities around our business parks through the five employment conversion approvals. Um, we did it based on a strict set of criteria, such as preserving employment density, setting timeline criteria, producing high density housing that we desperately need along major transit routes and within walking distance to a rapidly developing employment zones. And I'll, I'm gonna add, we made this decision before the massive rise in housing prices and interest rates. And we, as a council had recognized the need well before the current housing, housing crisis we are in with these decisions. Our strong position was reinforced at the region of Durham in December, 2021. And these decisions form part of the municipal comprehensive review, which should be submitted to the province in the next few months, as we've discussed. Uh, a couple of things. If we do nothing and let the MCR run its course, the zoning changes wouldn't be able to be triggered for a minimum of 18 months, which we've heard from staff is, is a suitable timeline, and we'd be developer initiated. So I really appreciated the speakers come in and ask the questions and make their comments today, because one of the questions I've been getting is why the MCR don't own now? And there's a few reasons. First, Bill 23, which I referred to earlier, has changed the rules, and it's unclear whether the MCR will be allowed to complete. The region's continuing as if it will, but this hasn't been confirmed yet by the province. And if the MCR is halted, then so is the vision of our council on these five projects. The second, there's nothing to guarantee that what gets built on these lands is the same as the concept plans that we've been shown. Through an MZO, we can stipulate employment densities, building heights, request timeframes, and affordability components. And I, I use the term request. Um, this motion includes safeguards to halt the MZO process. Again, as by request, if it doesn't achieve the desired outcomes, I believe um, the MZO that Mr. Novak referred to in Pickering was rescinded at the request of council after um, much, much debate and process. Uh, third, through the MZO, we can accelerate these five projects that have already gone through the full planning process. The MZO only bypasses the requirement for amendments to the Ajax Official Planning Zoning Bylaw. Zoning only. An applicant will still be required to obtain site plan approval and or approval of a draft plan of subdivision, and the town can still require all of the normal studies, reports, and drawings during this phase, including an environmental impact study. Uh, development charges for the town, region of Durham, and school board will continue to be required to be paid at the time of the building permit. Fourth, we need this housing as soon as possible. We all agree there's a housing crisis. Uh, if we can do something about it today, rather than wait years, potentially, we should. We all know that nothing is getting more affordable with time. By zoning now, landowners can develop at today's costs and interest rates versus futures unknown. And I 
hope everybody took note of the hospice delegation we heard earlier. And those of us on regional council are aware of several regional projects that are of a social nature that have almost doubled in price due to uh, conditions and market conditions and delays. And finally, the province has already removed 112 acre parcel of land from the Greenbelt in Ajax. This was done with zero consultation, zero notice. And I know of several owners of Greenbelt lands in Ajax that have hired consultants and are currently lobbying the province to remove more parcels from the Greenbelt. I want to demonstrate to the province that we have sufficient lands already within our urban boundary to meet the targets of 17,000 new homes in Ajax by 2031 without having to open up our Greenbelt lands or leapfrog. This motion will put the zoning in place for 4,100 new residential units not currently being considered and preserving the 50 jobs per hectare designation that we would get under the current zoning. Um, ignoring continuous, contiguous development and stretching infrastructure to unserviced areas will result in a heavy financial burden at the region. Um, we've all seen the water and sewer budgets. The MZO process has been abused, has been suggested by a couple of our speakers tonight. However, Ajax has shown on two prior occasions with the support of the province that an MZO is a powerful planning tool when used in a responsible and predictable manner. And we have used this planning tool to accelerate 192 bed long-term care facility with an associated retirement residence, and also to bypass a frivolous Ontario Land Tribunal appeal to allow thousands of jobs to be created on the Annadale lands. I'd suggest that this motion is the same. We've satisfied the planning process. We're merely cutting the red tape and getting the zoning in place. I understand that some of you may have some concerns. Um, some of our delegates have touched on some things like proximity to schools, things like that. Um, there's several instances in Ajax where these things already exist. Ajax High School, for instance, Bolton C. Falby. Um, I'm sure there's others, those come to mind right away. Um, but, and also about whether we can specify how many affordable units um, site plan has to be approved within a certain time frame. those types of things. This is possible, and this is something, some things that will be negotiated between staff and the minister as far as what goes into the MZOs. And then assuming they are approved and, and issued by the province, these types of things can be dealt with through the site plan process, which we've heard quite a bit about tonight, which will still be followed in full. So today is just the zoning and recommending specific conditions to those zonings. The request of MZO to accelerate the five projects is supported by staff. They've been approved by Ajax Council and Regional Council. Um, I'm not gonna support any motions to amend or separate these requests, either in my mind, support acceleration of the new housing units in Ajax or you don't, These, um, I think that decision's been made. Uh, that's all I'll say on it for now. Uh, I'd like to request a recorded vote, please, Chair. Thank you. A recorded vote has been noted. Regional Councilor Crawford, as the second on the motion, did you want to speak on this? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I mean, it's no secret that I have spoke um, strongly uh, in opposition of MZO um, <clears throat> process. and uh, But I have done my homework <clears throat> in that I talked to a few different developers and talking about... Uh, what the advantage is to uh, to them uh, is an MZO. Again, it's the zoning piece that they're looking at uh, specifically. I've talked to staff and staff have, again, assured most of what the mayor, I'm going to be repeating what most of what the mayor has said. Um, in my mind, uh, public consultation is gone by the wayside. Uh, whether it's through MZOs or Bill 23 or Bill 109, the province is not interested in public consultation anymore. Um, they want to accelerate development, and that is where they're going to go. So whether it's through MZOs, 23, 109, whatever it is, uh, you know, that's that's going to fall off the wayside regardless. Um, what what satisfies me is that the site plan still has to be. Uh, go through our our own staff, that EA studies are still done uh, through our requirements of our staff, that traffic studies are done as a requirement for development through our staff. And um, and I think that for me, that's, that's a piece that is incredibly important uh, for development. Uh, we can't, we can't sprawl out, we have to go up, we don't have any other options. And quite frankly, I don't want to use the green belt if we don't have to. 
we have the space that's been freed up for us, but we also have developers that are willing to make these um, these homes for people to come. I mean, I do not agree that having rental apartments is going to turn Ajax into a Jane and Finch area. What I know is I have two children that will likely never own a home in my lifetime and they need a place to live and it can't be with me anymore. So I know that there needs to be a place for my family to live. And that's the bottom line. And I'm tired of hearing that this is a downgrade of our town. It's not. It is the development of our town so our families can stay here. Maybe they move out, maybe they don't. But I want to be able to offer my family a place to live. So that's why I am supporting this motion. Thank you, Regional Councillor Crawford. Um, Councillor John Moore, I see you're on the uh, speaker list and I see others. I'm going to use my ability as chair to actually speak first uh, because I can. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'm gonna start with questions actually to um, to staff. Um, so hypothetically, and this is, I'm sorry, not even hypothetically, this could happen. Um, the, uh, the developers get an MZO, all these provisions are in place, but they sell the property to another development. That developer wants to build townhouses, right? So this doomsday scenario that is possible that I, you know, have seen. Um, is there anything stopping that? So it's just like, uh, with, yeah, site plan goes to the town, but based on the um, zoning, wouldn't that be allowed? Uh, I'm not sure that's to Stev or to Jeff. Uh, to the chair, uh, Councillor Lee, uh, Steph can jump in here too, and so can Sean McCullough. Can you just restate the question? There's sure. so, kind um, of two there, there and I'm just confused between what, what the actual question was. That's fair. Um, if they are zoned for residential, right, and the developer just arbitrarily decides, so we, we grant them the MZO and they're zoned for residential, can the developer then just ignore all these requirements and just build townhouses? I believe how the MZO would be laid out would have prescribed regulations in there dealing with densities and heights and the type of built form and those types of things. So if we're talking about apartment dwellings and we're talking about floor areas and we're talking about heights, townhouses, would not necessarily fit into those those categories um, as reading every every MZO here or the CNR that we're looking at talks to mixed use development. And that's what we're looking for through these. I believe that's what council's putting forward through the, through this request. Could someone take that MZO or that zoning and then just do townhouses? Uh, not, not in my opinion, based on the prescription of the MZO that would be before or in place on the property. Stev, Sean, is there anything that you guys want to add there from the, the planning section's perspective? Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, you, you covered it very comprehensively and succinctly. Um, I would think that the only recourse would be for the uh, if there if there was a new landowner to ask for a revision to the MZO or uh, a rescindment of that MZO. But if they were to sell the property um, to a new developer, right, at any, any one of these five, um, would that new developer be bound to the MZO as prescribed? Uh, yes, it would be tied yes. to the property, I believe. Yes, and uh, Steph, that's confirmed as well. Correct. The MZO is with the property, not with the applicant. Okay. Um, so I, I stated to Mr. Novak before, and again, I, I first and foremost, you know, like I don't want to be accused of anti uh, housing. I am currently one of the only renter. I've never really owned a home uh, in my lifetime. And my wife and I do very well. And I said this at regional council during the MCR review, and I'll say it to all of you now, I am currently paying $2,800 rent. It's quite a lot. And th th uh, thankfully I'm in a position where I'm able to pay for it. But at the same time though, um, I'm also 
uh, home ownership is just as out of reach as Maryland's kids, right? So I don't want people to think that this is me being NIMBY or anything. My concern ultimately is with this government. And we've already alluded to this. We've said, oh, Bill 23 has changed the rules. Uh, the, par the, par uh, the province has removed 112 parcels of lands. Uh, we don't have to use the green belt if we don't have to. If the province was truly serious about this, then they would change the MZOTO rules, things saying the municipality could withdraw at any point and the ministry would follow that. But this has been a very developer-friendly um, provincial government. That is no surprise to anybody. So my concern always remains is once the MZO, once we've given the MZO, what stops the developer from, you know, finding ways around it or creative ways around it? And it's 18 months to the mayor's point is generally a what we have to wait. But if we wait through the MCR process, then if I'm not mistaken, the motion we had passed to submit to the MCR, had all these built-in things, there are bylaws we can uh, create to ensure it is going to be mixed use. There's no finagling. There's no around that. And more importantly, um, we won't be at the mercy of a developer-friendly provincial body. Um, this idea that, you know, the MCR may not be finished, I've heard nothing about that. You know, ultimately, the region finished with 2A, which is pretty much developer uh, friendly anyway. So I, I see no reason the province uh, rescinding that. Um, and I agree, we need housing ASAP. But, you know, like we already sped up this process uh, two years ago by even permitting these to be zoned residential. These were all zoned for prestige employment. And we said, you know, it's ironically enough, two years ago, housing wasn't even a priority during this whole process. The process, the priority was jobs at the time and jobs per net hectare. And that was that was all that was all was talked about during that meeting. We didn't really talk about housing. You know? So I'm just like my my concern, and the mayor and I have gone back and forth. I don't think there's any nefarious intent from us. I, I'm concerned about nefarious intent from the developer and nefarious intent from the province of just saying, oh, once this MZO is issued, that's your zoning and you're stuck with it. And that it's, it's, I don't think it's out of line to think that this province would do this to us. And that is my concern. I'm, you know, if there was some written provision from the province saying that, yeah, if Ajax wants to rescind the MZO, we will absolutely honor that. Then that's fine. That all my concerns are gone. But all the wording in the MZO and the issuing of MZO says it's a sole discretion of the ministry. So all these affordable housing provisions, uh, on staff consultations, it's all window dressing and it's not enforceable as far as I'm concerned because the, the problems can just make those decisions. So I'll leave it at that. Again, I, I'd love to hear from the rest of council. I'm, <laughs> again, I, I have, if I'm wrong, then we've just wasted 18 months. We've waited 18 months and we'll still get what we want. But if I'm right, then we've prevented ourselves from getting screwed over by this province, screwed over by developers who are not acting in good faith and just building what they want and building million dollar townhomes as opposed to affordable rentals. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your uh, everyone's time. I'll now go to uh, Councillor Tyler Morin, followed by, followed by Councillor Dyes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I have a question to staff through the chair. Mayor Collier alluded to it in his um, summation. So what was, again, the unit count assigned to Town of Ajax through Bill 23? So we have a mandate, we have a criteria, we have a level that we need to hit. So maybe, Mayor Collier, could you just repeat that? Or, or maybe somebody from staff through you, through the chair, whoever wants to answer that question. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Tyler Morin, the allotment that Bill 23 assigned to the town of Ajax uh, through their fulfillment of bringing 1.5 million units to market by 2031. Ajax's allotment was 17,000 units, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, thank you so much. So we're responsible for creating 17,000 units. Okay, give or take. So when I look at uh, this, this motion and I see 2,800 apartment dwellings, see 150 townhouses, 800 apartment dwellings, 200 apartment dwellings. All I'm doing is looking through the eyes of a young person, it's been already stated here, who doesn't have an opportunity to get out of the basement, doesn't have an opportunity to leave their home, um, maybe isn't in a, in a position to pay, you know, what it takes to rent an entire house. So for me, I, my heart goes out to those that are waiting 
to try and get on with their lives. Forget about even buying a home, even being able to get out and buy, you know, a couch, you know, on a TV and with their partner and move into a place. That's that's just growth. And it must be very, very tough on somebody who's stuck at home because they just don't have the inventory. They don't have anything here. So for me, that's the, the, who I'm looking at. I'm also looking at people that are getting older that want to downsize, maybe don't want a mortgage anymore. They don't want a home anymore. And they want to move into an apartment. These are all opportunities for the residents of Ajax. And I'm a resident of Ajax to a regional council of Maryland Crawford's point. My kids moved out of Ajax in order for them to get what they needed. And this speaks to maybe if they were here, they'd, they'd be here. Anyways, I will be in support of this because I'm looking through the eyes of our residents, our residents' kids, of young people that are trying to get ahead. Um, and I'm very happy to see that the process includes environmental study, the, the planning process, even with the MZO, it still includes environment. It still includes transportation studies, repeating what my other counselors have said, or colleagues have said, but I want everyone to know why I'm voting in favor of this. I think it's it's a responsible thing to do. And um, yeah, I, 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 you know, if we do nothing, then we're going to get nothing. But if we do this, then, you know, we can we can bring this all to fruition, God willing. And um, thank you. But I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, regional council, or excuse me, excuse me, Councillor Tyler Morin gave you the promotion there. Uh, next on the speaker list, I saw regional councillor dies. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, just through you do planning staff, I'm wondering if you can give us some sort of idea of in, intensification projects that are going through the planning department now or have been recently done. Uh, through the chair to regional councillor Dyes, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Stav uh, just to to go over that. She she's our uh, manager of planning, and she does your lovely uh, tracking, updating charts of all our development applications, and is uh, well aware of the day to day of our uh, pre cons and processing of all our major applications. Uh, go for it, Stav. Thank you, through the chair to uh, Regional Councillor Dyes. Uh, the town, the planning department has uh, several uh, site plan applications currently in process for high density uh, mixed use development. Uh, most of them are located within the downtown. Uh, we do have one application for high density mixed use in our GO Transit Station uh, mixed use area. And uh, we're also seeing um, an application currently for site plan for a um, for the Rosslyn Audley uh, lands. Um, the beginning, the first site plan uh, in a series for a uh, a new mixed use um, residential community along the north side of Rosslyn. So I believe we've um, had some on the old part or the old area on Harwood, Harwood Avenue, north of 401, we've had, I think three, we've got a townhouse unit going up and we've got plans for three other in intensification projects along Harwood. We've got the Pat Bailey Square where we've got four more high rises going in there. Um, I think 25 stories high. Um, and, and the more you think about it, you remember more and more that there, there are a number of big projects, is there not, that are are being looked at and and talked about even um, in in Ajax? Yeah, and through Councillor uh, Chair Lee to Regional Councillor Dyes, they're they're happening within all wards of the town. They're not just in one specific area. Two fifty five Lake Driveway adjacent to the Discovery Bay Plaza. Yes, the Midtown. Uh, Texas Burger, the the mid block through there. Uh, Steph referenced Medallion development on the north side of Rosslyn between Audley and Crothers Creek. Uh, we have Ravenscroft and Taunton. We have uh, Taunton and Audley. We have a number of areas that that there are intensification 
uh, air happening in high density mid rise buildings. Even discussing with Rio Can, who's our big landowner along Highway 2, and looking at the redevelopment of some of those lands within their holdings. So, uh, yes, that definitely building up uh, is, is where things are going within the town. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you for jogging my memory on some of those areas. Um, I do think it's important to understand that. Uh, as this now this now municipality moves forward into intensification, which is something we have always supported, we have talked about intensification for the past twenty years that I'm aware of, and we know it's been coming. We know we can't afford urban sprawl, so for all of those reasons, we've been going moving towards that. But there had to be developers that were interested in that, and now we're starting to see that, and it's starting to move. And that's a great thing. But then COVID hit, and all of a sudden it became a priority that we were in this um, unprecedented time where you know we had zero housing and we needed it was a housing emergency. But that didn't happen overnight. That happened over decades of different governments not investing in affordable housing, for instance, and in rent geared to income homes. And it and and it was really difficult, in my opinion, to you know get people's head around changing how their town was going to look from um, you know a subdivision kind type of development to intensification. So for me. I think we need to be very, you know, we think we need to be methodical to a certain point, not too slow. I understand that we need to move quickly as well, but we also need to do it right. And we haven't done this right, in my opinion. The MZO just rushes things forward when we really need to have a conversation of how we put residential intensification in, you know, prestige employment lands that were not ever discussed. It was never discussed as being residential. Therefore, we don't have any parks. We don't have any schools. We don't have trails. We don't have connections for families and children and dogs and people to use. And that takes a little bit of planning. And I think we're jumping the gun a little bit. If we want people to move here and stay here, you have to also build the infrastructure around those residential housing houses that make it a neighborhood. And that is so, so important. And it's coming, it is coming. But I don't think that, you know, pushing MZOs on this five, on these five properties is going to give us what we want at the end of the day. And that concerns me. It's not really in our control. We didn't get the um, long-term care top up for the Schlegel Village. We didn't even know as a council who was going to build on the Annandale lands. So there's a lot of unknowns here about MZOs. There's a lot of non-communication about what moves forward. And we have to answer to the public, not the province. And I have a real problem with that because they are not the planning department. Our planners are experts at what they do. They do this all the time. And we plan communities, not the province. So I think it's better to go through our department and which we will be going through an official plan review where we can actually talk about how we start to implement these ideas into our community, these intensification projects to make them fit and what they should look like because every neighborhood is slightly different. For, for, for all of these reasons, I have so many questions about how these processes work you know, I'm not comfortable with it and, and I really can't support it moving forward, even though I recognize sitting on many boards of affordable housing and not-for-profit housing and seniors housing. I understand the need. I understand the need, but you have to you have to put these appropriate buildings in place that are going to be successful. A non-successful building is not going to cut it. So I have a lot of questions and I, I'm sorry I can't support it for those reasons, but thank you for listening. Um, I have Councillor Henry. Hi, uh, through the chair, I have some questions for staff, the planning department. So my first question is, uh, Mayor Collier mentioned about, and so did Councillor Crawford, about not using the green belt and using the lands we already have. So th through uh, the chair to staff, if we do this, if we say yes to these five MZOs, does this in any way 
stop the province from touching the green belt? Have we made a deal with the province that to use these lands as opposed to the green belt? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Henry, uh, I, I, I don't think they have anything to do with each other. The, the MZO and the, the Greenbelt conversation are two totally separate conversations. None of these requests that Council have put forward, either through the conversion request or the MCR process or through the motion today, are on any lands that are within Greenbelt lands, and staff have not been part of any conversations with regards to the question you asked about green belt lands in exchange for MZO or, or vice versa. Correct. So when, when it was mentioned earlier that we have lands that have services to them and we can use those instead of going to the green belt, even if we did use these lands, there's nothing stopping the province from going into the green belt in Ajax, correct? I, there's nothing stopping the province from taking the green belt plan and erasing it from the face of the planet. I mean, that would be under the province's purview. Um, but that's, we're not talking about the green belt today. The motion before you is dealing with MZO requests for five properties that have been considered. I realize that. I realize that. But, it, yeah. but, but when it's mentioned that we have properties available instead of, I just wanted to clarify that. So my next question is, um, with regards to the process, that would normally take place in lieu of the MZO, there would be a consultation with the school boards, correct? For both public and Catholic. I can take that question. Go ahead, Steph. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Councillor Henry, um, if these properties did not proceed through an MZO, uh, and went through the standard planning process. Once the province approves the region's um, um, official plan amendment to change these lands from employment to community, then the town would have to undertake an official plan review. There is a public process associated with that and the school boards would be um, consulted as part of that as one of the agencies. And then there would be a zoning bylaw uh, review component as well. And again, um, they would be circulated and consulted as part of that process. Sorry, Steph, you cut out for a minute there. It's my internet, I apologize. But that's, you're referring to the process without an MZO, correct? Correct. So with an MZO, are the school boards in the loop? Are they part of the process? So with the MZO, uh, when the site plan application comes in, then the school boards would also be circulated. It's a standard circulation. A standard circulation. Okay. We're required so under the Planning Act to circulate to the school boards and all public entities a site plan application. Okay, so of all the, the five MZOs, I have a problem with 250 Roslyn Road. And I realize that these are not being separated, but I have a big issue with this particular land because it's on a corner, because we're talking about adding to schools that are not in the school zone. I've already checked with both school boards. Da Vinci and um, St. Paquita are both at full capacity. So kids would be, and I quote, bust across um, Ajax, according to Scott Greaves, the superintendent of business financing at Durham Catholic, bust across um, to different schools. So for on the public side, it would be Lincoln Alexander. So going westbound in the morning on Roslyn Road. And it could also be a number of Catholic schools that children would be bused 
um, across to. And I don't know if this is the proper time to ask this question or not, but I'm going to ask it and you can tell me if I should wait. Um, how would that piece of property in particular at 250 look like? How would children enter onto a bus? Would they be, would we be stopping traffic on Roslyn Road for a bus? Would this happen? Because I'm not seeing how the, how a bus would enter this particular development. Can someone speak to that for me? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Henry. Um, well, the site would be designed in such a way that the bus would be able to enter into private property if there was pickup. Uh, bus pickup would not be from Salem Road. Uh, it would probably be from the local road, Pengaskill, if that's the frontage by which the development would front onto. Um, if there was a requirement for lay-by or something like that, that's something that could be designed into the site. Um, we've yet to see a site plan. So if that's a concern, uh, that's definitely something that we could uh, flag and deal with at that time when we're considering an actual development proposal. Okay, and then there would be traffic studies done, right? Because we, I'm hearing, I'm hearing that uh, out of the four um, in Ward Two, none of them would be able to go to their home schools, and they'd all have to be bus. So there would be a traffic study done as well. As mentioned uh, through the chair to Councillor Henry, as mentioned previously, any site plan submission would require a traffic impact study to be submitted and reviewed by our traffic professionals. That would also be circulated the region of Durham, their transportation section. They would also look at from a look at it from a regional perspective too. So we'd have two levels of traffic professionals reviewing the, those traffic studies. Okay, and. Okay, and here's another question. Um, what are the benefits with these five MZOs to the current residents? Well, I'll say the four, the current residents of Ward 2. What are the benefits to current, not future, current? I don't know if I could answer the question as to what the benefits are specifically for the, for the Ward 2 residents. Um, I think the benefits for the community, if the MZOs are, you know, considered by this council and move forward through the process is that we could realize uh, increase in housing and units and move towards Bill 23 obligations that have been bestowed upon the town, um, increase uh, the jobs and the employment uh, component, uh, realize these developments sooner. Um, I, I don't know if I can speak specifically to the Ward 2 residents and what benefits this would bring them. Um, maybe I would turn that question back to yourself, Councillor, and ask you what, what your constituents would think the benefits would be to any type of development within the town and, and how that would uh, affect the Ward 2 residents possibly. I have, I have asked, I have asked residents and I've, I've received emails and phone calls. I've not heard any, that's why I'm asking. I've not heard anybody come forward in favor of this in Ward 2. So that's why I'm asking these questions. Um, to be clear, when a developer uh, receives an MZO, they still play, pay the developer fees, correct? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Henry, what do you mean by developer fees? Do you mean building permit fees, application fees, developer development charges? charges? Sorry. Developer. They would pay development charges at the time of uh, acquiring their building permits for the for the development of the site. Yes. Okay, and the, and just to re reiterate the timeline for houses built with and without an MZO, the difference in time. The difference in time mm. between not doing an MZO for these five MZO versus doing an MZO is that that your question? 
Steph, Sean, you Correct. guys answered this question previously, so I'll let you guys go there. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I, I will take the question, so through the chair to Councillor Henry. Um, if we are looking at specifically these lands that require uh, a land use designation change, um, we there, there are different levels to this. If the once the region's uh, official plan is amended so that these lands are changed from employment to, com to community area, the developer then has the ability to accelerate um, the local land use permissions by going through an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment to get their approvals um, and get the local um, permissions in place and then go on to a site plan application. Um, if they went through that process, the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, um, under a uh, process under the timelines for Bill 109 is 120 days. Um, if the developer chose to wait for the town to update its official plan and zoning bylaw, to put those land use permissions in place, then it would take several years from the point of the regional official plan coming into effect. Okay. Thank you, thank you for that. I would just like to say, um, I, have, I have similar concerns to that of uh, Councillor Dyes and Councillor Lee. Very, very similar concerns with regards to uh, the MZO and the properties. And, and it's not about a distrust with the province, but it's about relinquishing control to the province and what that looks like. And uh, there's been many questions I've asked of the province in the last two weeks, as well as to planners. I've met with Steph uh, and uh, Sean. And I have concerns regarding this, I have to say. I, I'm not totally sold on this. Um, not getting, um, n not being able to cancel an MZO as Councillor Lee had spoken to, it does give me some concerns. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regional Council Crawford, sorry, I actually missed, uh, Councillor Bowers ahead of you, so I'll just let her go first before we go back to you. So, uh, Councillor Bower, please. Thank you, Chair. I, please forgive me for my voice. I'm talking as loud as I can. So I wanted to echo some of the comments that Regional Councillor Dyes made when we talk about new housing, um, affordable intensification, or projects that are happening. Four towers at Pat Bailey Square, Lake Driveway Tower and Townhouses, uh, Pickering Beach and Bailey, Pick, uh, Bailey and Salem. There's a proposal for two towers on Westney. There's development at Shoal Point and Bailey. The big tower coming at uh, 310 Kingston. I think there's development at Church and Highway 2. There's along Harwood Midtown, Hunt Street. So development is happening. And I think these five conversion requests that we approved, this development is also going to happen. So my concern is um, if we support the SAMZO, there is no guarantee that we are going to get what we want. And I spoke with the mayor at length about his motion and he, and he confirmed that to me. And we're asking these things doesn't mean we're gonna get them. And you know, for example, if we go back to the Annandale MZO, you know, I supported that. Um, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to or not, but I did. And a lot of it was based on the fact that the MZO we were presented with was a multi-story distribution center warehouse. And then lo and behold, none of that, it didn't happen that way. So then it was discovered that it was a concept. So I felt, I felt tricked, I'll be honest. That, that we asked for one thing and we didn't get it, we got something else. 
So it fell within the realm of the samsara. I was, it was explained to me. But to me, I thought, no, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I feel fooled. So for me, I have concerns about giving up the control, about we can do this if we, you know, we can request these amzaro. Doesn't mean we're going to get them. And again, it comes down to, um, you know, we, we're asking the province to do something, but it's going to end up being the developer. And we can ask them to, but we don't know that we're going to get that either. So um, I, I just, I'm hesitant. Um, <clears throat> well, I saw the sleazy use of MZO, not by Ajax, and that created a bad taste in everyone's mouth, which Ajax help, um, help spread that. You know, we protested. So, um, so I just have some, some hesitation about this. 18 months seems like a long time, but <clears throat> If if we approved it, the region approved it, that's going to happen. And I'm not certain, I'm not sold that we need to have an MZO or support an MZO. Those are just my comments. Thank you for listening. Regional Councillor Crawford. Yeah, so um, I have been a former school board trustee, and I know that families are not having children at the rate that they were having children 22 years ago. Um, and I know that currently in homes and developments all over Ajax, they are being bused all over Ajax to all different schools. Um, that is, uh, that is common because the schools need to get filled up and, uh, to, in order to have a viable school, they're going to have to move kids from all over before they build any new schools. They have to fill up the ones that they have. And uh, I think it takes something like 350 kids to see, and they need to see the whites of their eyes, not the pregnancy test, to uh, build a school. In order to do that, they go into uh, a school that's half empty. They build that school up. Lincoln Alexander has been uh, a home for those kinds of that, those kinds of developments for years, years and years and years. So um, it's not, it's not, you know, just because there's an apartment building going up and it, it might have to get bust across town. It might be a permanent solution. It might not even be a solution. It might be a solution that's just temporary. Um, could you confirm too that if an MZO is issued to these five properties, if they don't have demand to build the properties, they're not going to build them, correct? Anybody? Um, that's a through the chair to regional councillor Crawford. That's a market based question that's beyond my level of expertise. But it stands to reason that somebody isn't going to build a 25 story apartment building if they can't fill it, right? There's no, there's no benefit to a developer there at all, whether they have an MZO or not. Typically yeah. developers through the chair to Councillor Crawford don't just build stuff on, on spec without right. knowing that they can fill the building. Right, and there's no guarantee that the MZO is even gonna get approved by the province. I mean, it probably will because of the trajectory that they're going for development. Uh, and my comment around the, the, the green belt was not to, all I was saying is that if we can get these five conversions done and there's a component of uh, affordable housing in these developments, then that takes away from anything that would have to be added into the green belt. That was my only point in that. That's all I was going for. Not that we were one for the other. Uh, that's all my comments. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask for last kind of questions, comments before we go back to Mayor Clyde to wrap up. Uh, Regent Councilor Dyes. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to add to that um, previous, my previous comments that, you know, this, any community, municipality, whether it's town or whether it's a city, they're constantly in change, constantly in change. They morph all the time and they have to, to keep up with demand. And we're seeing that in, in the older area of Ajax where the old wartime here, houses are being torn down and bigger homes are being built. And you'll, you're gonna see that too, say if two properties are up for sale and somebody could tear both down and build some, as you know, three or four townhomes. 
So there are all kinds of things that can happen through redevelopment and it's continuous. And I have it on the end of my street where an old plaza was taken down and 16 back-to-back -to -back townhouses were built. That's intensification. And that's providing homes for people with a different income level. Is But you know we know we have to go that step further, of course, to provide more options for different income levels. But I, I just wanted to say it, it's not something that happened. It's not going to all happen now within the next 10 years. It's going to be continuous. They're just looking for ways to jumpstart it and to get it moving. And we've known that for quite some time. And we've been working on that also through our planning department to look at different intensification projects. As Councillor Bauer said, it, it's an issue of trust. And um, I can tell you that I have not had anybody email me or speak to me about MZOs that did not distrust that, that whole system. And I think that's very important um, for the public um, when they come forward and, and you know tell me their concerns. I think we have to listen to that. We have to make difficult decisions, yes. But I think um, it's an overwhelming response that I've had against these MZOs from past history and what's happening around the province. So thank you. Professor Henry, I believe I saw your hand up. Yes. Um, looking at these, I, I have to say three of them I don't have an issue with, two of them I do. And had the motions been separated, I might have a, a better feeling about this, but I do have concerns for some of the locations and I want, a, I want affordable housing, actual affordable housing to get people off the street. And the wording of this motion, where feasible, I'm just not seeing what I'm looking for here. Um, I want to get people off the street. I want to see them into homes, family homes. I want to see our kids that grow up here, stay here, live here, be able to afford here. The affordable housing that we're seeing, what we're, what we're classifying as affordable housing, and that's why I asked Stain Record what his definition was, because it is not necessarily what people are calling affordable housing, what people can actually afford. And we're going into a recession and we need to create something that gets people off the street and keeps them off the street. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask my final questions. Thank you everyone for your patience. I think we're going to move very close to the vote. Um, through the, not through myself, to staff then. So if we were to go through the MCR process, the non-MZO route, would we be able to include any sort of inclusionary zoning, any sort of affordable housing um, requirements? So as opposed to the line that says um, feasible, we can actually mandate it? I, I will take that question. Um, inclusionary zoning, uh, we are only permitted to use that in major transit station areas. So it would be the mixed use area around the Ajax GO station. Uh, areas outside of that, we do not have uh, the legal authority to require it. It would affordable housing and the level of affordability would be a process of negotiation um, with the applicant. Thank you. Um, so my last question is actually to Mayor Collier. So Mayor Collier, you've spoken to these five various developers, I'm assuming um, none of them have approached me or, you know, contacted me. So just, um, is there, are they providing any sort of guarantees regarding affordable housing to address Councillor Henry's concerns? Well, I haven't actually spoken with them in some time, but when I did, um, absolutely is one of the things that I stress very strongly during those discussions. As I said, these concept plans are here because I requested that they put them together and bring them to council. I wasn't about to support conversion applications based on goodwill. I don't wanna be the mayor that supports converting commercial to residential and gets a bunch of townhouses and got played. You know, the, I, I spoke very at great length to that in the February, 2021 meeting about what conditions can we put in place to make sure what we see is what we get and so we don't get played because Councilor Lee I absolutely share your skepticism or yeah. distrust of both the government 
and certain developers. And again, if somebody turns around and sells to somebody else, I want to make sure that what we see is what we get because we're making this decision based on a set criteria. And that is creating housing and, and, and maintaining the jobs on those commercial lands. You know, we, we, if we allow what's happening now, and I'll use 250 Roslyn as an example, because Councillor Henry brought it up, um, the piece that was allowed in that 250 Roslyn is set right back in the corner. What's currently going in there right now is seven single story pads, kind of like what we see um, at the Durham Center and other places, restaurants, convenience stores, dry cleaner, whatever. Great, that's great but it's not a lot of jobs. And if that takes up 10 acres for seven single story pads, we're losing the opportunity for highest and best use of those lands through adding housing on top of that. And that's what mixed use is. So I I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it did. Um, thank you very much. Um, I literally have been on the fence 50-50 on this. Um, you know, our council, I think it's going to be a four, three vote is it seems, you know, the ones who support this seems to have a lot of faith in these developers to honor the commitments in the province to, you know, back us up. Should they be not, not be acting in good faith. And so I have to have faith in that myself, I suppose. So um, based on the need for housing, based on the need that this is something we agreed upon and ideally the province isn't going to stick it to us, then yeah, I think I am in support of this. So um, Mayor Clare to wrap. I just wanted to thank you, Chair. I, I just took a few notes and I just wanted to clarify a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, one, um, to staff and to follow up on Councilor, your question about um, if the MCR process goes through to fulfillment and we have the zoning bylaws and we put some of these stipulations in the bylaws, can you, um, again, just answer the question based on that, would a developer be able to turn around and sell that to somebody else and have somebody come back with a completely different thing and then appeal that to the Ontario Land Tribunal if we said no. Uh, through the chair to Mayor Collier. So your question is, if we don't do the MZO, we go through right. the MCR, the, o, the land use permissions are in place, then we right. do the zoning, the zoning's in place. The zoning looks like the zoning that we want for mixed use development, et cetera. Could somebody come in and reapply for a zoning amendment to change it, to make it something else, and then appeal that decision? Yeah. Yes, somebody could do that. Somebody could reapply to change the zoning at, on any of the properties. Right. Um I knew that. I just wanted you to say it rather than me say it because it has more credibility if it comes from you. And this MZO request today has the support of staff, yes? Yes, it has the support of staff. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments because I'm, I'm not a planner, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a lawyer. I have to take the recommendations of staff and I trust their recommendation. And I supported the recommendations at the region also, even though we lost that one on, on some of these things. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of things and, and just what I started to say with Councilor Lee to his question. Um, I don't trust the province. I don't think given Bill 108, Bill 109, Bill 23, Bill 3, the last two years, I don't think anybody can trust them. And this was a government that I fully supported when it came in. But there's been no consultation, and I hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot with this MZO request if it passes by speaking negatively. But, you know, we have no guarantees. But the one thing that is guaranteed is if we do nothing today and this doesn't pass, in two years, we might be sitting here and having the exact same conversation. Councillor Dyes, when she spoke, talked about it's taken, we've been talking about trying to create more units of housing for 20 years. And I know because I've been here and we haven't done it, right? We're talking about affordable housing and creating other types of housing units. I have my parents are in their 80s and they have friends selling their houses and leaving Ajax. Like we talk about the young people. 
Um, but we also have seniors leaving in Ajax because they're going to Whitby and buying those condos by the by the lake there because there's nothing in Ajax. Um, we have a number of developments, as Councillor Dyes and staff um, confirmed, in the planning process today. Several of those, like 282 Monarch, doesn't have sewer capacity. I mean, it's going to take us still probably five years to minimum to get that sewer capacity sorted. Um, we know Medallion is building pretty much all rentals at that at Pat Bailey Square, even though it was supposed to be half condo. It, it's we talk about control, and right now we have no control either. And I feel that control comes with being able to put these conditions in the in the MZO because as staff just confirmed for me, going the normal route and having the zoning is appealable. And we all know how we do at the Ontario Land Tribunal when it's appealed. One, it's taken out of our hands. And two, we lose. <laughs> You've heard me say it many times and it happens, we lose. We're the elected councillors. We can't, what if, what's the province gonna do? We ran on creating more housing. <laughs> I think we all did. And I said, I was bringing this motion forward in January to try and cut the time frame and move it forward. And then Bill 23 came and completely changed the rules. So I, I don't, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I feel kind of talking on both sides of our mouths that we say in one case, we, afford, we support affordable housing on the other and, and creating other units. And then, but we're unsure and let's just wait it out and see what happens. And I, I'm not doing that. That's why I think that we took an aggressive move a year and a half ago, 21 months ago, actually. So 21 months have passed since we made this decision and another 18 or so months are gonna pass if we don't do anything today, over three years. And then shovels get in the ground and it's still another two to three years past that before it gets through the site plan process and actually we have something. It, it's not something when we talk about timeline that, that I wanna allow. So uh, I've asked for a recorded vote, um, Chair, and um, hopefully council will support this and we can move this forward. Thank you. Um, sorry, I was gonna wrap up with the mayor. Um, Councillor Henry, Councillor Bauer, do you guys have quick comments? I'll go with Councillor Henry first. Uh, thank you, through the chair to the mayor. Mayor Collier. Are you telling me we're going to get affordable housing out of this? I want to hear you say it. Absolutely. I can't tell you how much, and I can't tell you where it's going to be because we can't spend other level of government's dollars. That has to go through the site plan process, and that will be negotiated as we did, and I'll use 310 Kingston Road as the, as the poster child for this. They wanted reduced parking. We came back with we want affordable housing, and we got it and a big amount of it. Um, but those things happen at a later date. We're only talking about zoning today. That is it. We're trying to shave the year and a half off of the process to get the zoning in place so the site plan process can start and these can move ahead. The only reason I'm bringing this today is because these concept plans are there and these developers are ready to go. So that's, that's the whole thing. Later on during site plan, if, and again, 310, after we approved the zoning, they had already agreed to do it, but then they got CMHC financing of, I think it's $142 million, which again, really helps the project and really helps the affordability. Those are things that happen after the fact. They won't know if they're gonna get CMHC funding from the federal government, like Pat Bailey did, Square did on Tower 2 as well. Right, they don't know those things till after. There's no way we can make those decisions today, but I'm going to make damn sure that we ask for these requests and these conditions to be put in the MZOs. When and the province has been pretty clear, and I did speak to our MPP and I did speak to Municipal Affairs and Housing Staff, the Chief of Staff. They want us to put together exactly what the wants are on each of these properties. They don't want to be the ones doing that. They want us to put it together, tell them what we want on these sites, and then hopefully they'll approve them. And when I talked about the um, appeal on the other version through a zoning bylaw appealable to the Ontario Land Tribunal, if we put these conditions in an MZO, not appealable. And 
just like being registered on title, transferable from owner to owner if they sell to somebody else. I think that's where we get the control. Okay, I, I hope I answered your question, Councillor Henry, but I, I am absolutely committed to getting as many affordable, whether it's rent geared income, whether it's below market, whether it's um, condo units at, at below market. But um, again, we don't get to make that decision today. Okay, keep in mind, if I vote yes for this, I want 20%. 20% affordable <laughs> housing. I'm telling you what I want. <laughs> well, I, just, to, just to round this out with the 310, with the parking, I mean, we do have those, those leverages. Ms. Romanuski, maybe you, I don't know if you, you need to expand on that, but, but that's up to staff. And again, we don't get to make the site plan decisions anymore. That was taken away from us in Bill 109. Or was it Bill 108? Regardless, that was taken away from us. So these are going to be staff negotiations. I trust our staff to do the great job they did with 310 Kingston Road, um, which is the most recent example. Uh, Councilor Bauer. That's a good example. That's good development. Good development. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I think I think it goes without saying that with all new development, development, we will push for affordable. Um, affordable housing. So my question, I forgot to ask it. Um, with or without an MZO support, will Ajax meet the 17,000 by 2031? Or is this a do or die? Um, I guess I'll ask the Jeff, um, Mr. Romanescu for that answer. Uh, who's the chair now? Are you still the chair? <laughs> through the chair, through the who's the chair? Surprise, through the, Michael through, Jan, through yeah. somebody that's the chair to counselor <laughs> to counselor Bauer. Um, is it a guarantee? Nothing's a guarantee, uh, but it will provide us five additional properties that we can add to our inventory that will give us the ability to move much closer to the seventeen thousand. Uh, it'll complement the other sites we have around town uh, that will contribute to the 17,000. Uh, if we were successful in getting the Hunt Street extension over to Westney, that'll help uh, build that number and get that number closer. So uh, I, I, I feel like I, I feel like it, it'll make it more achievable or at least push us in that direction of being able to achieve the 17,000 number, if that answers your, your question, Councillor Bauer. Thank you. I think what you said is um, it, will, it will add to this, or we will work towards the 17,000. If an MZO is supported, it, it's um, just a quicker, like we may or may not, and the timing might be sped up or it might not. Because without an MZO request, these conversions are likely to still go ahead. Maybe that's a statement. I don't know. It's not a question. I'm just thinking out loud. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you, Councillor Bauer. Without further ado, I will call the clerk to call on the recorded vote. Thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, Mayor Collier. In favor. Councillor Bauer. Opposed. Regional Councillor Crawford. In favor. Regional Councillor Dyes. Opposed. Councillor Henry. In favor. Councillor Tyler Morin. In favor. Regional Councillor Lee. In favor. That motion is adopted. Uh, I will take the chair back. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Great job. I think we should have a five minute break. Actually, let's do a 10 minute break and we'll be back here at 9.15. Thank you.
But thank you for letting me finish, Jason. And we are live. <laughs> thank you. Um, we'll go to now presentation 5.3 2023 allocation HX Partnership Fund, Cassandra Cruciano, Caesar, Senior Advisor of Grants and Strategic Initiatives. Cassandra, whenever you're ready. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I know that Cassandra's here. Mm -hmm. There she is. Sorry about that. I realized I was on mute and I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for uh, the introduction. And I am here tonight to provide an update to, uh, to Council on the 2023 AJAX Partnership Fund allocation um, that have been uh, approved by senior management for the community. Um, so if everybody can see here uh, the presentation, can everybody see the, the slides? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um, for a reminder to everyone uh, on what the partnership fund is, uh, the partnership fund was approved uh, in principle last June by AJAX Council. Um, to consolidate all of the town's uh, corporate giving initiatives under one major program uh, with the goal of providing about a million dollars in funding over a four year period, um, which coincides with the term of council that has an annual uh, budget of $250,000. Um, so the goals of the renewed program, which you'll see here, um, are really uh, simplifying the application process, expanding eligibility, increasing transparency, uh, and, and really putting a renewed focus on promoting the town's contributions uh, that are made uh, to the community, whether those are cash contributions through grants um, or by in-kind uh, usage of our facilities or amenities. So how we got here today, um, I'll just provide a, a quick overview um, that the kind of starting in the early November, uh, we started our outreach to the community, um, letting them know that this new program was going to launch and that there were grants available. Um, sort of mid-November uh, the 14th, we sent out some uh, an email blast over 300 organizations, and we actually launched the program on November the 15th. Um, we held a webinar which had some pretty great participation from 41 uh, unique organizations on November the 23rd, and then we closed applications on the 6th. Uh, following that, in the week following, um, the applications were scored and reviewed by staff in public and strategic affairs, uh, and then following that, presentations were made to senior management uh, recommending organizations for approval. Um, as of December 20th, those that were successful have been advised um, that they were conditionally approved, and we also let folks know that weren't successful, uh, that they um, weren't, were, would be welcome to meet with staff to get some feedback on their, uh, on their proposals. So we, be, we have begun uh, some conversations with those that were approved um, to really ensure that we have some quantifiable uh, and tangible metrics that we can keep them uh, accountable to and that the town can track and celebrate to make sure that we're getting the return on investment that we're looking for with these funds. So that brings us to today, which is an informational report to council advising of who um, has been conditionally approved and then moving forward, um, there will be the uh, approval of the operating budget, of course, which is, is key to allowing those funds to actually flow to the organizations, um, but also to finalize the partnership agreement uh, and begin meeting with those that were unsuccessful. So just a high level summary of, of what we received. We received 80 applications and you'll see some pretty stark numbers here. So you'll see that, uh, we're looking to give away uh, or to grant uh, $250,000 per year uh, to the community. And I know council's seen these numbers before, but we felt it was important to share with the community the, the demands that we saw um, come through for this program. So the maximum amount we asked every organization to provide us a, a minimum amount that they'd, they'd like to receive uh, and a maximum amount that was required uh, to complete their projects. And we received uh, in total, when you add all of those up, an ask of between 1.5 and 3 point, just under $3.3 .3 million, um, with the average averages being between about 20 and $40,000 each. 
um, which is uh, substantial. <laughs> So here, um, these, are, uh, these are the categories, the applications uh, that were submitted. So these categories were self-selected um, by the applicants themselves. Um, and you'll see here that the majority of those um, were around diversity, equity, and inclusion, quality of life, supports for youth, supports for seniors. Uh, and then we moved into some around community safety and well-being, economic development, sports and recreation, the environment, and other. We, um, as a result of opening up the eligibility, um, previously our corporate giving programs were, were limited in, in who was eligible to those not-for-profits uh, or registered charities, um, but we did ex expand our eligibility to um, for-profit or private businesses, um, community groups that, you know, aren't uh, necessarily incorporated um, as not-for-profits or individuals. Um, you know, we had groups of people that lived in communities that came together and lived in a neighborhood together and put together a proposal about working within their, within their neighborhood um, for a program to make the town a better place. So each of the applications that we received were scored uh, using this matrix here, and this is a sample. Uh, and you'll see that uh, the areas that had the, that were weighted more substantially were making sure that the applicants uh, had the ability and the capacity to complete the proposal that they were, uh, pro that they had submitted, um, that there was an understanding of financial feasibility, uh, as well as uh, alignment with um, the town's, uh, with the town's objectives and, and making sure that there was an understanding of that this is a partnership. And so the funds that are being given to the organizations um, are, are being done so with the intent that the town is at the table and the town has, a, has an interest in making sure that these, um, that these initiatives are successful um, and that they, are, uh, that they involve the town, achieve our, our strategic priorities um, and, and have a meaningful pathway to partnership uh, for us. So you'll see here that in the overview um, of the 80 proposals that were uh, received, um, 39 of them have been rec or were recommended to senior management and subsequently approved. Um, they break down in across four tiers um, of small, smaller amounts of funds to larger amounts. And you can see here that of the $250,000 allocation, um, we have set aside or approved at this point $229,700. Um, and that is largely as a result of staff working with the organizations directly um, to say, listen, everybody came to the table and asked for as much as, as they, they could. And, and we encouraged organizations to do that where possible. Um, you know, when an organization would say, well, how much can we reasonably apply for? We would say apply for exactly what you need, apply for what you'd really like to receive. And then we'd whittle it down from there um, based on, on what, uh, what we had the ability to grant. Now, one of the, you know, based on the increased demand that we saw, um, there were cases, there were a lot of cases actually, where an organization would come and say, listen, we'd love $100,000 for this initiative. And so, staff had to make that decision where we wanted to balance approving as many high scoring applications as possible um, with the limited funds that were available. So one of the things that we had to do was go back to organizations and say, listen, we know you asked for $75,000. Would you be able to do this with 10 or 15 or five? Could you scale back your proposal so that we can still support it and we can still partner? Um, so that exercise uh, has taken place and, and these are the numbers that we've landed. So you'll see here, there's a balance remaining for the in-year asks and bursaries. So that includes any, um, between now and the end of the year, any potential projects or proposal that comes forward um, that meets the criteria of the program, um, but perhaps is time sensitive. Um, and it also includes the budget for the Ajax Shining Stars bursary program uh, that's run through uh, the diversity and inclusion portfolio as well. So what I, uh, I will do tonight, and then and, um, Mr. Mayor, I, I, you know, please feel free to, uh, to cut me off if, if you feel that I'm providing too much information, but I do want to run through um, each of, you know, at a very high level, what each of these tiers are and, and some of the grants that we're, that we're offering um, through each of those tiers. So 
the first tier here is the uh, largest tier. So these are our, you know, we would consider these signature projects. These are uh, large dollar figure. Um, they are, you know, largely capital uh, in nature, um, you know, with the exception of the one grant with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. But these are high dollar figure, high impact um, for, for key community initiatives. So this is the new can uh, towards cancer screening equipment at the hospital. Um, the expansion of the Charles Best Center um, in Whitby, uh, which is, of course, in line with contributions that have been made with other municipalities and is, um, is, is based on the, age, the number of Ajax residents that use that facility. Um, a, a youth greening partnership uh, with the Toronto Region and Conservation Authority, which uh, intends to plant uh, over a thousand Indigenous trees, shrubs and wildflowers through some programming in Ajax and to fully fund the renovations and furniture upgrades uh, of two of the 12 bedrooms at Horizon House um, in Ajax. Uh, tier three, these are uh, another four um, uh, organizations that have a, a large breadth of, of impact uh, across Ajax. Um, you'll see Roadwatch here. They're, you know, we support Roadwatch annually, um, and we're also looking to provide them some additional funds towards a mobile speed board uh, to help with the reporting that they do uh, and the assistance they provide both our transportation division and DRPS. Um, Girls Incorporated, this is uh, to enhance and expand a program that they offer uh, or that they try to offer each year to uh, 50 girls in Durham region. Uh, scientists in the schools, this is to provide their programming. Um, so this, the $10,000 that we provide will you know, result in 40 workshops for about 650 Ajax children and youth. Uh, and then our friends at the Ajax Legion um, who are, you know, they, pro they offer services to veterans, their families and members of the Legion, but they, they would like to expand uh, who actually gets to attend the Legion and who goes in and the rentals that they offer. They wanna play a bigger role in the community. And so in order to do that, they need to expand their kitchen. Um, and, and with that comes with the requirement of a fire suppression system. So our proposal is uh, we've approved to fund the, um, the purchase and installation of the fire suppression system. Tier two, these are, um, I would categorize these as pilot projects. These are, um, these are smaller uh, projects that, you know, go up to about $5,000. So you'll see in here, um, this is for organizations like the Alzheimer's Society and the Dementia Friendly Satellite Program at the ACC that they're looking to implement. It's the Food Literacy Innovation Zone at the Barrett Center. It's a mobile hub stop uh, for uh, in Ajax that's being organized by the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Um, it's for the Christian Family Outreach Center uh, and the hub uh, to enhance their current therapy groups and purchase new computer stations. Um, you'll see here that this is includes contributions to the Durham Children's Aid Society for their Holiday Hope campaign. Uh, the Durham Rape Crisis Center, uh, we're, we're going to fund the development of 25 survivor kits um, to help provide education and services. Um, Durham West Lightning, this was a really exciting, unique one um, where there are 16 players, 50% of whom are residents of Ajax that um, will be participating in the first ever girls division uh, at an international peewee hockey tournament in Quebec. Um, and hockey helps the homeless. So this is a contribution towards their fundraising campaign for Joanne's House. Um, we make an annual contribution for a partnership that we do with PARA, um, the support that they provide our Ajax Fire um, for search and rescue initiatives in Lake Ontario. Um, Spark Angels, uh, we're looking to support uh, some, they're almost like Dragon's Den forums uh, for Ajax, or they'll be held in Ajax, and they're focused on new entrepreneurs and perhaps those uh, focusing on, you know, as mentioned here, young newcomers, retirees, other underrepresented individuals looking to start businesses. Um, St. Andrew's Community Garden uh, will be uh, supporting a couple of capital purchases here uh, for raised beds and accessible plots, uh, really to ultimately increase the accessibility of St. Andrew's. Um, Durham Region International Film Festival holds their annual uh, annual film festival at St. Francis each year, so these funds will be used towards that. 
Um, you'll also see Rang to Rang is here, and they are uh, an organization that will be partnering with the town to hold an Abrat Tree event, uh, which is something that we uh, ourselves don't normally um, do, but we'd partner with an organization that could help us put that on. Uh, same with the Looking Back into the Future Black History Month conference. Um, and so now we move into tier one, uh, which are smaller dollar figures of up to $2,500. Uh, and these are small, uh, small amounts of funds that we anticipate will have high impact. Um, so the first one being the, the continuation of the Caremonger's phone hotline uh, at $2,500, um, supporting the delivery costs and volunteer recruitment for the only 2S LGBTQ food bank in Durham region. Um, further uh, support for the 18th Annual Durham Black History Month event, um, a couple of uh, material and competition costs for robotics clubs at Jay Clark and Pickering High, um, another uh, Carnival of Stories Black History Month event that will be held in Ajax, um, Arts on uh, uh, Women of Color Durham. Uh, so this is a partnership that, or it's a pilot pro pro program, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that's geared towards uh, primarily women, racialized women, non-binary people, femmes, and they're individuals that have perhaps traditionally faced obstacles to participating in sports and recreation programming. Uh, and so this project in particular is, is interesting because they have funding from Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment uh, to their foundation to hold this program this year. So we're partnering on a pilot basis, but this may be an example of a project that after one year, uh, we move into uh, we move into one of the other tiers and provide some additional funding once there's proof uh, once the you know information has been provided. We've seen how successful the event can be, um, and then I, these are the last few. So art classes for ten newcomers, um, funding for boys and girls clubs, youth uh, uh, sort of youth mentorship and professional programming, um, purchasing some sports equipment for the Durham Basketball League. Uh, funds for Probus Ajax, and you'll see between Probus and the Rotary Club, um, they're both looking to increase their membership. So some promotional materials and other pieces like that we're looking to provide some funding for. Um, Ajax Creative Arts is going to hold some artistic workshops for, uh, for seniors. Um, there's the Durham Black Youth Mental Health Week, um, which includes some event class that's happening at Jay Clark in partnership with DRPS uh, and CARIA as well. Um, Durham, Family and Cult Durham Family and Cultural Center, it's another Black History Month celebration that's looking to take place at Viola Desmond. Um, we're going to help Lake Ridge Community Support Services purchase some um, inclusive materials. These are books that represent different types of families, different ethnicities and religious backgrounds um, for autism therapies that they provide. Um, and also to provide uh, $1,200, which may seem like not a lot of money, but would make a big impact to hold um, meeting and event costs to really engage the residents of Hubbard Station. We've, we've heard from uh, a resident there, and that's an example of an individual that applied um, that said that they'd like to hold these, uh, you know, some events and engagement opportunities in the building uh, to, to foster a sense of community. So these are some examples uh, of what um, of what we're looking to fund. And, and right now, this, this is a total of 39. Um, so our next steps, and, and this kind of brings to the end of the presentation, is we're going to be finalizing partnership agreements. These are the, um, you know, the, the documented agreements with the, with the partners. Um, outlining what the town's expectations are, are, you know, what are eligible expenditures, more of the administrative side of things. Um, the operating budget uh, is required to be approved uh, by council in order to make sure that the funds are uh, issued <laughs> um, and are available to be issued. Um, Public and strategic affairs is going to be uh, collecting uh, dates and uh, specific information about uh, opportunities for council's participation in some of these initiatives, um, as well as these kind of more promotional and, and celebratory, you know, chances to celebrate the investment, because I think that is um, a key element of, of the program in general. Um, and then we will also in the next couple of weeks be open to, uh, we will be scheduling meetings with those that were unsuccessful um, to provide those that feedback um, that they might be looking for. Um, as well as encourage them to uh, and, and help them frame their applications for 
uh, the next round of, of uh, proposals that will be that will be collecting come August of this year. Uh, so we will be launching the 2024 program in August of this year. Um, and I will be back before the end of this year to provide a wrap-up presentation to Council that reports on some of those more tangible numbers, KPIs that uh, the organizations have uh, committed to uh, achieving through these proposals. So we will be working, uh, uh, you know, kind of on an ongoing basis over the next year to make sure that we are um, we are recognizing the contributions of the people in the community to furthering the town's strategic goals, um, but also making sure that that's a two-way street and ensuring that we are, um, and council's being provided the opportunity to celebrate um, these, these great investments that are happening in the community. And with that, I, uh, I will conclude my presentation and I am happy to take any questions um, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cruciano. Uh, first hand I saw was Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to say how proud I am of uh, all of this that you just showed us. Um, that we've been able to give back into the community is so amazing. And to be honest, the the numbers were actually staggering of the need still, right? So the the high end and the low end. And uh, and I I've already got a lineup of people wanting to go the next time around. So. Um, I, I, what, what I want to really say is I want to thank, uh, Cass and, and Liam for your professionalism, for your patience with, um, with our residents, because I know that many of them needed help in the application forms. And, um, I, I know that, that their experience was one that, uh, made me proud. Um, and so thank you for everything that you've done for our residents and helping them even in this fund and also in other grant funds um, that they might be accessing. Uh, your, your expertise is noted in the community and your level of patience also. So from, from me to you, thank you so much. Uh, and again, this makes me very proud. I'm sure there's a question in there somewhere. Uh, Councillor Henry. <laughs> sorry, no, no, sorry. No, there was no question. Sorry. I'm teasing. Councillor Henry. I would like to thank Cass and Liam's department very much for all your hard work. I've heard a lot of positive feedback from those who have applied. I'm very excited and happy to see Horizon House on this list. That that warms my heart like you would not believe. Um, and I just I'm I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of people that have applied and uh, have seen the value in this and how you've been able to break this up into so many worthy groups that applied. It's amazing. Great job. Just great job. No question. Just great job. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Dice. Thank you, Chair. And um, no question, I'm sorry, but just a comment to Cass who and and all the staff that worked on this. It's a, it is an amazing job. I remember we've more we've worked on this for years and years trying to get it to this place where we have over 80 applications and many different organizations, businesses, you name it, community partners coming together to make improvements in our town. And, and they all are really basically supporting residents. And it was really nice to see all the various different programs that have come forward with this. And I'm, I'm really pleased that we can help. It's true community building. And I think um, I'm very proud of what you've put forward here and proud of the work that you've done. And I, and I just wanna say thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands, Councilor Bauer. Thank you. Great presentation. Such an excellent program. Thank you so much for this. So I, if I understand, the next one of the next things you're going to do is contact, uh, or have you already contacted the unsuccessful um, applicants? Sorry if you, if you told us and I forgot. And you're going to work through the with them so that they can reapply next time. And by, by reapplying next time, will they, um, 
Are you guaranteeing that they will get the funds that time? Through the, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Bauer, thank you for the question. Um, yes, so we have uh, advised those that were unsuccessful that they were indeed unsuccessful and invited them to meet with us. Um, we will be providing guidance on how they can adjust their, their proposals for the next round of intake, um, but we won't be guaranteeing that they do get that funding just because we don't, you know, we can't guarantee what we do get back. Um, and there are some, for example, uh, is that we found, you know, there were a number of private entities that had come to us and said, we'd love $100,000 of seed funding to create this, um, uh, a software product, for example. And that would be an example of, of an organization where we might say this, you know, this might not be the right program uh, for you, but let's, we want to maintain that relationship. That's where we might, you know, hand them to economic development or refer them to the Spark Angels or, or some other, um, there might be more appropriate ways that, that we can support these organizations. So short of, um, guaranteeing their funding uh we wouldn't do that but we would certainly provide them with all of the feedback and tools um that they would need in order to be successful uh in another round okay thank you very much great job excellent job thank you anything further by any members of council no thank you miss cruciano cruciano sorry for your presentation um I will bring forward the departmental report 7.4.1 at this time. Just let me get to it on my sheet here. Moved by Councillor Crawford, seconded by Councillor Dyes. Not quite there. There we go. That council received the support for information. Those in favor? That is carried. All right, Ms. Cristiano, you can probably go now. <laughs> probably a much later night than you originally thought. Going back to the agenda, that concludes our uh, delegations. Moving on to correspondence. Do we have any polls from correspondence? Councillor Lee. Yes, Chair, I wanted to pull, I think it was 2324, the two motions on Bill 24. Okay. Any other polls from the lengthy correspondence? Hearing none, we're moved by Councillor Lee, second by Councillor Henry. That the report dated January 23rd, 2023, containing items of correspondence be received for information. Those in favor? That is carried. Councillor Lee, to, do you want to deal with 23 and 24 together? Um, they both kind of cover the same thing. So yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Ultimately, it's just um, respective uh, motions from Cambridge and Kingston regarding Bill 23 and um, mirroring some of our concerns with Bill 23. Uh, Cambridge uh, specifically mentions uh, notes about um, setting limitations or uh, defining um, affordable housing as well as setting uh, specific market rates. And Kingston is more of a catch-all as to the, um, the issues of replacing the loss and development charges that we had previously brought up. So I'm just hoping to endorse those two. Okay, move to endorse. Can I get a seconder, please? I saw Councillor Tyler Moran first. Um, Councillor Tyler Moran, do you wish to speak to this? As a second? I'm good, I'm good. You don't no. have to. No, I, I, I'm i good. Uh, the, the first did it well and uh, I'm in full support. Yeah, I think this reiterates what we have already said through our comments to the province and what, from what I've seen, all municipalities that have commented have said pretty much the same thing as well as Ontario big city mayors. Um, one of these asks for them to pause the process and go through public consultation. As Councillor Lee said, define what affordable means and what these different things type of means. So I think we're all saying the same thing. Let's hope um, that, uh, that they listen. So on the motion to endorse, those in favor? That carries, thank you. Uh, we've already dealt with the reports on the partnership fund. Uh, let me go back, sorry, to the community affairs and planning. Moved by Councillor Tyler Moore and second by Councillor Dyes, the community affairs and planning 
committee report dated January 9th, 2023 be adopted. Any question or comments on the CAP report? Seeing none, those in support, please show me your hands. That is carried. Thank you. Uh, there is no general government committee. There is no supplemental. Moving on to, we've done the partnership fund. Financial sustainability plan 7.4, moved by Council Lee, second by Councilor Bauer. The council approved the financial sustainability policy updates for the following policies. Uh, financial 120, financial sustainability plan, discretionary reserve administration, discretionary stabilization reserves, discretionary capital reserves, discretionary reserves. Questions on the financial sustainability plan? I just have a couple and I um, I guess to myself, to Ms. Valentin, uh, I'll try and go from memory because I don't have it in front of me. It was more to, and I know we discussed this before and I, and I sorry to blindside you because I should have sent you something earlier. You're talking about the spending caps and increasing the spending caps to, I think it was 90%. Yes, that's correct. But then somewhere else in the report, and I'm going from memory, it says, but those are either, the spending cap is, is basically it's not adhered to anyway. It's either over or under generally. In the past, we've been over in most cases. So I guess my question is, why do we need to even have a spending cap? Um, to answer your question, the mayor, thank you for your question. Um, and we did contemplate this when we looked at this. We um, in in preparing the budget over the last few years since I've been back, the sixty five percent percent spending cap guideline. When we start to work on the capital budgets. Um, that is um, a, a, um, a guideline that we look at to try and build the reserves, save money for the reserves for unbudgeted projects throughout the year, over budgets, emergencies. So we try not to deplete the reserves. Uh, what we found over the last few years, especially uh, through COVID and the escalating prices of things, um, less money going into the reserves. So it's the, the the guideline, the spending caps are based on the funding going into the various reserves. So with the decrease in the, um, the casino Ajax revenues, our spending caps have actually, um, it's, the spending allowance has actually decreased, but the cost of a replacement of, of um, equipment, vehicles, uh, building repairs has all continued to increase. Uh, we're taking on more assets as, a, as the community, as the municipality continues to grow. So we have more assets. We were just finding it very difficult to keep within that 65% spending cap. Um, for the budget coming forward for 2023, we actually used a 95% threshold. But when we went back to the um, uh, the policies here, we're, we're we're bringing forward 90%. Uh, when I looked at the over budgets and unbudgeted for 2022, um, they exceeded $3 million. So um, mm -hmm. if we went above the money going into the reserves, we would be depleting our reserves each year. Right. So we would like to start at that point with the discussion with senior management to, to, um, to see if we can stay within those guidelines. Okay. And... I guess my question is, I mean, I think now that I've thought about it a little bit, I would prefer to, I, here's what I'm thinking, and tell me if I'm wrong. If we set it at 90, that now becomes a target, and that's what we're going to be probably at most years. Whereas if we leave it at 65, and we approve as a needed basis, those overages as needed, it kind of forces us to try and shoot for that lower spending limit so i guess what i'm thinking is i think i'd rather keep it at 65 but just approve it on a one-off basis as needed rather than just say we're going to go at 90 because i suspect we might be at 90 every year going forward is that fair or am i off uh well here? some of the challenges uh some of the challenges we've been experiencing uh even with the, the 65 percent threshold we have had exceptions and that has been in place probably for the last four years, even prior to me coming back, where um, the replacement of fire vehicles, for instance, um, we would take them right out of the spending caps because 
the value of them in themselves would probably eat up the whole 65 percent mm -hmm. um so we've taken them out we've taken out roof replacements um and it Put those as exceptions so they're they have not been in the last few years in that spending cap anyway so we're trying to build it in um in a more reasonable more realistic number okay and you're suggesting that 90 percent is a more realistic number at this point yes is that something that you see being the case for the long-term future um actually We'll have to relook at these policies again when we do our financing strategy through the asset management plan. So legislatively, we're required to have a financing strategy by July 1st, 2025. Um, I think that will provide us with more direction on the reserves and the, the spending cap guidelines as well. So if, if I move to amend this and keep it at 65, it really doesn't change anything on your end. It just means council has to approve the difference, right? Well, versus it, versus it, it, if it, sorry, it, it's just a little more, I guess, unrealistic when we start the discussion at the senior management table. Uh, the projects coming forward are much more; they're costing more. Um, we it's really really difficult with um, the the number of projects coming forward and the value of them to to even stay within the sixty five. Okay, I'm not going to make that amendment. It's it's really a technicality because whether we approve the difference or not, I mean, we're we're exceeding the cap, whether there is a cap or not. I just want to go back to something you mentioned for clarification when you said a fire truck or roof replacement. You just don't even calculate that. Is, so are you saying if for fire, perhaps a year we bought a new fire truck for one and a half million, um, if we still spent the sixty five percent or seventy that would be in addition to that like we don't even calculate yes. that okay yes. so we could actually be at 120 percent given that scenario yes yes okay so there are instances where we are depleting the reserves in some cases based on large expenditures we are but uh, when we the last couple of years we've had surplus so we would put them back into those reserves that have been hit the hardest Okay, thank you. You you segue very nicely into my next questions on FIN 121, I think it is. I found it in front of me um, where, sorry, it's not 121. Uh, it is 121. Mm -hmm. So allocation of interest, you want to increase from 981 to 1281, which is fine. But then it says the additional interest will be included in the operating budget. Um, yes. I think the financial sustainability plan has always been any interest that we make has gone into capital reserves correct so uh the interpretation of that is the additional three hundred thousand dollars so moving from the 981 to the 1281 that additional three hundred dollars will be built three hundred thousand will be built into the operating budget but that and i'm using i think your words from prior years would that not leave a hole for the next year if interest rates go down and we lose that and we've included in operating, wouldn't we now have to kind of find that 300 for somewhere else next year? Um, we would if that were the case, but the 981 is a 2015 value. And um, outside of COVID, we have been hitting um, that value. And we're pretty confident that this is a, a, a pretty stable number that we should be able to hit. Okay. I, I have no problem increasing the number to the 12. 81 or 31 or whatever it was, 1. Point whatever million. But the extra 300 to operating, if we decided that no, we don't want that going to, to operating, where else would you suggest that, that overage go that doesn't go into the back into the reserves? Is there like, I guess what I'm looking at is stormwater, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, stormwater management is one that we talked about quite a bit. Um, uh, I think our is it our building or our vehicle is is strong, but there's there's some others that we're having challenges with. Would you be supportive of um, putting that into one of those reserves to help build those reserves rather than increase in operating? I'm I'm just saying this because interest rates have shot up very quickly. We're going into a recession likely, and I suspect interest rates are probably going to come down in the next few years. Um, and I don't want us to get in a situation where we've got a hole to fill in future budgets 
Um, I, I'm pretty confident at this point that the 1281 is still a fairly good number. Um, looking at some of the budget challenges that we're coming forward with, uh, we felt this was a good time to bring this in to help support the tax base. Um, we, I am bringing forward a report um, through the budget as well um, with regards to an infrastructure levy to support the reserves. And we always do look at if we have surplus um, to then um, replenish some of the reserves as well. So we're always looking at that. Um, I, I feel at this point, uh, moving this balance from 981, which was a 2015 value to 1281 um, over the eight years, I think that um, it's, it's a conservative um, increase, which I think um, would help with the tax base. Okay, just I just reread it again while you were talking. I want to make sure I understand it correctly. I was talking about my understanding from reading that was we're going to increase the allotment to 12, 1.281 million, but anything above and beyond that would go to operating. Is that not the case? Did I not read it correctly? No, sorry. The 12 okay, so you're saying we already put the first 981 to operating and we're going to increase that to 1281. Correct. Or 1.281. Correct. A little slow tonight, but I did get it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I just had, uh, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Valentin. Any member of council have any, anything else? Very good. Given that, those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work, Ms. Valentin. Thank you. Go back up here. Are there any regional councillor reports? Councillor Crawford. Okay, so from transit, um, I'm really happy to announce that uh, we have the tap option now on um, on the on the transit system. So you can tap your Presto or you can tap your credit card. That also includes links on your phone or your watch. So it's just a little bit more convenient for people, uh, especially if you don't need to have a monthly pass, but you need to take transit. Um, and also we've reached an agreement with Nova Bus for the purchase of six 12, uh, I think it's 12 meter batteries, uh, electric buses that will be delivered. Uh, I think it's in 2024. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, good news from transit for works. Um, the clear bag, um, pilot program, uh, that was supposed to happen in Clarington has been, uh, deferred to 2025 which uh, is good news for me because I don't think anyone in my ward is in favor of it. So I'm happy with that. That was a pretty short meeting. And uh, I just want to say Inspector Yamada is uh, going to be retiring at the end of this month. And I just wanted to give him a big shout out. Um, you know, the West Division was in a bit of a flux when uh, Inspector Haskins uh, moved out. And um, Inspector Yamada came in and really pulled that division together and I am so proud of the community focus that that division has uh, right, right down the line. All of the, the staff sergeants, the, you know, all of the guys underneath of him have really, um, he's gathered a great team together. And I'm fully confident in his successor, I think is Sean uh, Carter, I think. Is that, I'm not sure if his first name is that, but Sean Carter. And like, he's like a wall of a man. Like he's spelled the correct way. Right, right, the right way. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, given out to good hands and we look forward to that continued community service. And, uh, but I did really want to give him a shout out. I've been trying to connect with him. I went into the police station today and he's taking vacation time. So I haven't had a chance to actually go and say goodbye to him, but, and I know you'll never hear this, but from, uh, from, from my point of view, he's just done an excellent job and I'm really, really sad that he's going, but happy that he's retiring. Thank you. Any other, Councillor Lee? I think you're you're muted. My microphone, I apologize. Um, so at finance, we um, set the tax rate, overall tax rate impact at 5%, um, which is high, but 
with a lot of the uh, Bill 23 provisions, it's uh, kind of required. Uh, of that 5%, we are going to see, um, you know, DRPS, which our mayor sits on, wants to see a 1.65%. Uh, of that 5% is 1.65% dedicated to Germany's police services board to fund base pressures. Um, so yeah, I mean, over the next few months, we'll be finalizing the budgets, but we can expect no more than a 5% uh, impact on the regional side, um, which is high. But again, there's a lot of uh, outstanding pressures we didn't previously have. Uh, anything further? Councillor Crawford? Did that include water? No, I think the water was separate uh, of that because it was a levy. Sorry, I'm just looking at the business plans now. I will get back to you on that. I, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was water included or I not. thought that was separate. That's why. Yeah, okay. Any questions on the regional council reports? I, I just have one, and it's because I was sorry. I was, I was not able to follow the finance report, Councilor Lee, but I understand that the proposed budget from DRPS was reduced at finance. And I wasn't privy to the conversation. Do you recall what the what the I won't say logic, that's not the right word, but the the reasoning why they they reduced the request from DRPS? Um, I don't think we actually no, I don't think we did. I, I had mentioned reducing it at DRPS ultimately. Um, my rationale being because I asked the chief, you know, um, how many frontline officers is he asking for? And he's asking for 20 a year for the next five years. Yep. And again, I have yet to see any direct correlation between uh, crime, uh, crime prevention, and the number of officers available. So um, I still think there's an opportunity to um, reassess our resources, put funding into you know mental health crisis counselors, dedicated mental health crisis counselors. Because mm -hmm. the one thing I took away when the chief presented was that they have what thirty to forty percent of their calls are mental health related. Not all of them are violent crimes. And so it's it's just a way to free up those officers while, um, you know, allocating mental health resources as well. So again, that okay. was just off the top of my head. Nothing had been decided. We it's still uh, the numbers as on the report say are still as is. Okay, like I, I like I said, I couldn't attend, but I was reading the the police board agenda for this coming Wednesday, and there's a report in there that the budget uh, obviously on the budget and that that the ask had been reduced. I don't recall by how much. So. I just thought I'd ask, but um, I'll report back on that at the next meeting. Okay, I have moved by Councillor Crawford, second by Councillor Tyler Morin, that the regional council reports of January 23rd, 2023 be received for information. Those in favor? That is carried. Back from business arising from notice of motion. We have already dealt with the first item. Moving on to the freshwater action plan, I will turn the chair over to Councillor Crawford. Okay, uh, Mayor Collier, this mayor, the, you, you can talk. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, just let me pull this. Let me pull this up here. It's I'm juggling about five screens here, back and forth between all this. So just give me one second. Uh, I won't I won't read it. I'll just go to the there force. Um, basically, this comes out of and I sit on the board of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, um, which is a bi binational organization made up of, uh, I think, 130 mayors across Canada and the US that that support and move forward um, the the safety and security and cleanliness of our Great Lakes and St. Lawrence cities, uh, St. Lawrence River, sorry. And one of the things, there is the uh, funding available for this. I'll just read the thing quickly. Basically, the Town of Ajax supports the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative request that the federal government to commit $1 billion in funding over five years for a strengthened freshwater action plan in budget 2023. And we call on the federal government to guide its freshwater action plan funding to implement recommendations in the action plan of 2030 to 2020 to 2030. And we call on the federal government to directly direct priority funding under the strengthened freshwater action plan to projects in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin. So and to make municipalities eligible for future funding in programs announced under the strengthened freshwater action plan. So basically, I'm not going to dwell on it. It's getting late in the night. This is uh, Ajax supporting the grant application from Great Lakes for these funds. 
which will benefit us indirectly. And I would ask for council support, please. Sorry, I forgot I was sharing. Councillor Dyes. Thank you. I just wanted to speak to the importance of this as well. So the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative is a wonderful organization that represents a partnership between Canada and the U.S. with respect to the Great Lakes. And uh, we've worked together with them for many years. And we have an increased problem, as you know, with our water quality on the on the Great Lakes. Uh, climate change is a factor. Um, population is a factor. Shipping is a factor. There's all kinds of variables. We've got a lot of invasive species, both wildlife and both um, plant life. So it, we really need the, the Canadian government to stay involved and step up to the plate. Um, I know the U.S. funding is always greater than ours due to their population base, but um, they also have, they invest heavily in their tourism, which has made a huge difference and really is a positive impact on us. So we need to keep in our foot in or toe in the water, so to speak, and um, keep funding our, our lakes and the quality of our water because we all drink it and we need it. Um, and I think it's a very, very good program, very worthwhile in many different areas. So I do support this motion. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, um, all in favor? Thank you. Over to you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Great job, Regional Councilor Crawford. Okay, moving on to the NOMO May. Moved by Councilor Bauer, second by Councilor Dyes. Councilor Bauer. Thank you, Mayor Collier. Yeah, I'll be quick on this too. Uh, this was um, something that I heard about through residents of Ajax who talked about it. And I thought, what a great idea. So I, we, have a, we went to staff to talk about it. I actually wanted it to, to be called Beyond Domo May, as if you see from the content of the motion not just about not cutting your grass. Um, you know, our maiden Ajax solution, thanks to some input from um, bylaw, from operations, from our uh, supervisor of environmental sustainability, from Samantha and the office of CAO. It's all about these little actions that our residents can take to make positive changes and impact our community. So, you know, town I think we should be very proud we do tree plantings we do waterfront cleanup we do park cleanup we're going to be part of the sustainable uh, neighborhood action plan in ward three um during COVID we did the drive-through uh plant your own garden project um we had our pollinator garden at the Louise Johnson Parkette so those are all things that residents can take action so out of all of those ideas kind of morphed into let's make it beyond May and let's naturalize some areas one in each ward and really make um, you know some sustainable um, some sustainability within the town. Anyway I'll stop talking. So please support this motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dyes, this is Heckener. Would you like to speak before I go to council? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. It is it is a great program and thank you for bringing it forward. Um, when you think of um, the pollinators and, and how at risk they have been for many, many years now with pesticides and all of the other challenges, um, they go through the winter hibernating and they come out hungry. And just as that food is about to sprout up in the garden and in, in, in our um, plants, and flowers, we start mowing the grass. And it has a huge impact on these, um, these pollinators. So they're asking us just to hold back a little bit if you can, not to mow as often. If you know it's a big change, I get that, or sometimes the grass grows very quickly in the spring. So to hold back as long as you can, if you can hold back the whole month of May, that's great because by then they have some foods to eat other than the, what's in the grass and the dandelions. So um, it, it's about our pollinators, which if you have a beautiful garden, you rely on them all the time. You want them to be healthy and you want them to come back. So thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawford, you're next. So I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit confused by this motion, um, <laughs> only because only because the whereas didn't seem to match the be it resolves. So I was a bit confused. Like, are we asking residents not to mow? Because it doesn't really filter into the be it resolved. And then if they do, if they don't mow, do they get nailed with a property standard thing? Like, it's like, I, I don't, and then, and then my, just one other thing, my only experience with naturalization is, first of all, the lakefront, there was a little part, and I remember Pat Brown complaining every single year about the, the naturalization uh, garden there. Now, I know it's become accepted now, but I used to represent the other side of Roslyn Road, and there was a stormwater uh, pond that was naturalized that I got beat up on every single every single month uh, because it they didn't like naturalization. And then I get complaints about the deficit. I'm just saying, we I think we do naturalize certain pockets, um, stormwater ponds, pot, spots in the in the um in the waterfront. So I guess the I'm not not in support of it. I was confused with the top part. I read it like three times. Like, I don't understand what's and I think I even brought the no mo may to you last year. And I had like 75 comments of people saying, hell no. But, you know, so I was like, um, uh, and then then the bottom part confused me a bit. So I'll stop talking and let you explain it to me. Thank you for that question. So, so and I understand that. It started out as, can we do this? Or we ask residents not to cut their grass. So with input from staff, particularly bylaw, you know, we do have a byline that says grass has to be, grass and weeds has to be underneath a certain amount. So it started with, if we don't cut town boulevards or certain parts of the town, people are going to freak out. It's going to become a danger. So we don't want to do that. And then it also became, if people don't cut their grass in May, and then we, we say, okay, June, and they're going to cut it. It takes that much more energy and time and cost to get caught up. So we thought, okay, that's not a good idea. That's why it changed from B to a beyond no more May, where instead of just don't cut your grass, it's maybe you want to learn. So the education part of the Air Force or the viewers hall is let's talk to our residents, teach them about the importance of pollinators, the importance of naturalization, how you can do that simply in your own, your own private yard. And then we would also couple that because Ajax is always trying to lead by example by picking certain sections of each ward, keeping in mind, you know, they have to be reasonable where we could also do that. And then that way it's more than May. The education component, the so lectures through PRCA by keeping people what it is, why it's important, what plants are suggested and what kind of life um, life is life life is attracted to those plants who comes. So that's why it's the name's not doesn't really match. Um, <clears throat> but that's what what that was. Okay, just, thank you. I, I'm sorry I, I made you talk like that. Okay, but I hope I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, yes, thank you. Hey, Councillor Lee, you're next. All I heard was that I don't want to have to mow. I don't have to mow my lawn in May, so I'm I'm good to the board based on that solely. I don't even see the rest of it. Just I don't have to mow in May. Just let me tell my wife. So it's all good. Thank you. Oh, you just you have to keep it below 15 centimeters. Don't tell me what to do. Okay, all I'm seeing is no mow May. I support it. You got support. That's all you need. Councilor Tyler Moore. Very quickly, not a question or comment. It's a suggestion. I'm wondering on uh, Town of Ajax land if we could pop a little sign in, very minimal little sign that says this is the naturalized garden. So that when people are walking by with their dogs, that's who sees it. They go, what's with the grass? And then somebody says, oh, look at the sign. It's a naturalized garden. Just a suggestion, Something, <laughs> nothing heavy, doesn't have to be steel, little sign there, just a suggestion, might help. That's a great suggestion as well. Thank you, thank you. And number two, Corporate communications will put together a whole awareness program as well. Right, as well. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. 
Anything further? Okay, those in favor of no mo may. <laughs> that carries. Thank you. Moving on to the next, uh, moved by Councilor Henry, second by Councilor Lee on Joe Dixon Park. Councilor Henry, please go ahead. Thank you. Normally, I wouldn't read through all this, but this man deserves it, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, as we know him, it's not in the motion, but we all know him as Father Ajax. Uh, whereas the town of Ajax celebrates its history through the street and public space naming practice, which identifies and highly high, highlights legacies important to understanding the foundations of Ajax as a community. And whereas Lewis Joseph Joe Dixon was a committed public servant who began his political career as a Catholic school board trustee and was first elected to Ajax Council in 1983, serving as both a local and regional councillor until 2007. And whereas Mr. Dixon went on to represent the riding of Ajax Pickering in the Ontario legislation, legislator, like, yeah, legislator from 2007 to 2018. And whereas Mr. Dixon was also a passionate business person and community advocate sponsoring more than 1200 sports teams over 55 years. And whereas Mr. Dixon passed away on April 6, 2022, at the age of 82, resulting in an outpouring of condolences and stories of remembrance from residents and community stakeholders who knew and, re and respected him. And whereas in the summer of 2023, an unnamed neighboring park within the Mulberry Meadows subdivision, Sundial Developments will open at the Northwest corner of Ainsley Road and Turnberry Avenue and has been designed as a significant recreation focal point for the local community and will include a junior senior playground, gazebo, fence leashed, uh, sorry, fence leash free area, basketball court, fitness equipment, paved walkways, pedestrian seating and other public amenities. And whereas council deems it appropriate to commemorate Mr. Dixon's dedication and legacy of public service to the town of Ajax. Now and therefore it be resolved. Staff be directed to name the park at Ainsley Road and Turnberry Avenue, the Joe Dixon Park, and a copy of the motion be shared with the Dixon family. I've reached out to uh, Laura Oliver, who worked in Joe's office for many, many years. She was thrilled by this motion. I've also reached out to Donna Dixon, uh, Joe's beloved uh, wife, who shed tears on the phone. Um, thrilled, thrilled by this. I can say that many members of council wanted to be the seconder on this motion. I know that he, uh, Joe was very well respected by the entire town, uh, no matter what party. He was respected. I've had conservatives call this week and say to me uh, how thrilled they are by this motion. He was a beloved man. No one else like Joe in the town of Ajax. Um, I'm looking for, as a new person, this was something that was on my list of things to do in the first quarter. I had talked about this with residents out the door. I know that uh, community non-for-profits have also contacted the town of Ajax in um, asking that, that a similar motion be brought forward. And I'm hoping that my fellow councillors, I can't imagine anyone not voting in favor of this. Um, I'm hoping for your support on this motion and that we can all have a great day in support of Joe. And I'd like to thank uh, Sam for helping draft this motion for all the heartfelt words she put into this. Much appreciated. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to the mayor. Back to the mayor. I will turn it over to Councillor Lee as a seconder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, Joe Dixon was the oldest of 10 children, uh, seven of which were uh, sisters. He 
love to uh, share that information, any chance he got. Um, outside of uh, Mark Holland, I think Joe Dixon was probably one of um, my early, uh, lack of better term, political mentors. He was always incredibly uh, gracious, uh, incredibly um, supportive, and was always there to, you know, just share his experience, which was uh, his political career was spanned decades, and he had tons of experience, but was always a welcome sight within the community. Uh, thank you to Councillor Henry for letting me second this. Uh, it, d it does mean a lot um, as, you know, one of the newer councillors on council uh, to be able to, you know, put my name on this motion and to share the experiences of the great man that was Joe Dixon, Mr. Ajax. So um, I guess I will call a recorded vote only because I think it's important uh, that, you know, we, we, we show our support for Joe. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Tyler Morton, you're next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So in um, December 2021, some of us went over to the Ajax Convention Center for a Rotary Club dinner. So right beside Councillor, uh, Regional Councillor Crawford. And it was in honor of Joe. And it was absolutely staggering when they started going through his credits, as it says here in this motion, which I'm absolutely happy to support and so happy that it's been brought forth. It was staggering. The sports leagues, the service clubs, the worship centers, the town initiatives, Ajax Home Week. Um, and it, it, if anybody didn't know who Joe was, please Google him. Please look into this motion, all the words that are here. Absolutely. Uh, I remember saying to Joe one time, he says, are you going to run, Robbie? And I said, well, I know if I run against you, my parents will vote for you. So he, uh, he liked that. So happy to support and uh, very glad this came forth Thank you for my time. Thank you. Any further? I'll just wait in quickly. Glad to see this come forward. This fits our naming policy. Um, we've used this type of thing twice before that I can think of. Last term of council, one for Bill Parrish for the Waterfront Trail. And second, this was mentioned earlier, I think, by Joanne for um, Louise Johnson, or maybe it was Lisa for the, the pollinator garden there. Um, we do recognize uh, those residents that really rise above and beyond through things like the Civic Ward. But I think for those that really make an impact, um, this is probably the way to do it. And this is something that will last forever. And if Joe was here, I know it would mean a lot to him. I had the pleasure of serving him with him from 2003 till I think it was 2007 or eight that he became our MPP. And uh, yeah, very involved in the community and um, absolutely will support this. Uh, Council Lee, you already called for a recorded vote. <clears throat> okay, uh, Regional Councillor Lee. In favor. Councillor Tyler Morin. In favor. Oh. Councillor Bauer. In favor. Regional Councillor Crawford. In favor. Regional Councillor Dyes. In favor. Councillor Henry. In favor. Mayor Collier. In favor. That is unanimous. That carries unanimously. Excellent. <clears throat> Let me find my next spots. Uh, any new business or announcements? Councillor Crawford, followed by Councillor Tyler Morin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to announce that the Durham Region Ontario Parasports are beginning on the opening ceremonies are on Friday, February the 3rd at 7 o'clock at the Ability Centre. Uh, uh, you will find me volunteering on Saturday between 12 and 4 at Seated Volleyball. I believe the town of Ajax is getting our Be the Roar banner up and running. So if any of council would like to join and Be the Roar at Seated Volleyball, I, that's where you're going to find me. And we encourage all residents to come out. Their website, oh, I don't even have the website, sorry. Um, but the website is is up. There's going to, there is so much sports. There's actually... Um, a game being played at J. Clark Richardson. It's called um, Goal Ball, which is actually a uh, like like soccer uh, for visually impaired people. So you can't cheer at that because they need to hear the little 
ball, uh, the, the bell in the ball when they're kicking it. So it's, uh, I'm, I can't wait to actually go see that. I've never, I, I'm very, very intrigued by that. And uh, these athletes are amazing, para-amazing actually. And so yes. hopefully we'll see lots of residents come out and support these, these athletes as they support in their games. So that runs from February 4th to the 5th. Very good. I'll just add um, the town of Ajax is one of the proud sponsors of that event, as is the Mayor's Gala. So there you are getting full full town support on this. And I'll be there for the opening speaking on behalf of us on Friday, but hopefully the rest of you can attend as well and I can recognize you there. Uh, Councillor Tyler Moore, you're next. Thank you, Mayor. Please join Regional Councillor Marilyn Crawford, Deputy Mayor, that is, and myself, Councillor Rob Tyler Moore, tomorrow evening. Tuesday, January 24th at 7 p.m. We love our ward meetings. We're going to have a big one hopefully tomorrow night. Please go online. You can see our social media, but if you just want to go right to the website, it's uh, via Zoom, which we seem to get more people out to. Registration is required. It's, it's easy. Just go to ajax.ca forward slash ward. So if you forget that, ajax.ca forward slash ward, just head over to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You'll see it there. But looking forward to seeing everyone. Very good. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Um, yesterday was the Lunar New Year. So a gong hei fa choi and a sun lin fai law to everybody who celebrated. It is the year of the rabbit. No idea what that means. I assume it means the same thing. They all mean auspiciousness, good fortune, health, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Councillor Henry and I have our first ward councillor meeting on February 22nd at 7 p.m. It'll be a virtual meeting. So we're looking, to see, looking forward to seeing our uh, residents there. I believe Councillor Henry is arranging to have D, um, DRPS there with their, um, what was the division called, Nancy? CIP, CIPTED? CIPTED. Uh, CIPTED. Crime prevention, and we'll be looking at CIPTED. Thank you. Um, and then non-related to us uh, specifically on uh, February 4th, after you go to the Paris Sports Games, uh, please join Esther Ford and the Cultural Expressions Art Gallery in conjunction with the Durham Children's Aid, DC, DSB, DDSB, and the Congress of Black Women for their 16th annual Black History Month celebration at J. Clark Richardson at 5 p.m. And then a shout out for a friend of mine, uh, Shannon Oyenarin. I think I pronounced that right <laughs> change uh, also has a black history month event it's the eighth annual looking back into the future conference on saturday february 25th from one to three at the saint francis center for community arts and culture you can find the details on the website thank you chair very good any other announcements or new business council bauer thank you mayor collier i was trying to find the information but on Thursday, January 26th at six o'clock, TRCA, TRCA is hosting an information session on the TRCA Ajax Waterfront Erosion Mitigation Project. It is a WebEx. I'm, I wish I could find the link to tell everybody. It's probably on the TRCA website, but it's, uh, I believe you have to register for that as well. I just want to thank you. Any other announcements? Hearing seeing none, moving on to the confirming bylaw, moved by Councillor Tyler Moore and second by Councillor Crawford, that bylaw number 02 2023 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Ajax at its meeting held on January 23rd, 2023, be read a first, second, third time, and passed. Those in favor. That is carried. And finally, moved by Councillor Bauer, second by Councillor, Hen Councillor Henry, that the January 23rd meeting of the Town of Ajax be adjourned. Those in favor? Yeah. Who won the over under? I think I got it, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> by a large margin. Yeah, you, you all underestimated it. Great uh, job, great job Chair. Good seeing you, everyone. Are we, are we <laughs> offline, Mr. Clerk?